All right, welcome back, everyone, for our creature double feature on this. What day of week are we? Wednesday? Is today Thanks. Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. Uh, that's me, Peter. That is Scott in the pro home studio. Brandon, <laughs> Brandon will have his pro home studio soon. Nice. Uh, let's get into it. What, uh, what, what's top of mind? Well, I guess, um, you know, conversation started with me and you, Peter, after I watched um, Brandon's episode. And there's some things that I really liked about what he had to say. Uh, you know, there's not very many of us cannabis growers that get into um, the scientific studies. So I was really impressed to see that, you know, he's also digesting really difficult things and then communicating them in grower jive, which not many people are doing that. So I think that's something where him and I share similarities. Um, I also really liked some of the ideas or, well, you can, you can clearly tell that Brandon is also finding functional strategies for commercial cultivation. I think that's very important because, you know, it's easy in the regenerative community to get really lost in ideas, you know, and we, we have to, as pioneer species, which I would call Brandon a pioneer species as well, you know, as an early adopter getting in there, trying to figure things out. And in order for these organic strategies to compete at scale, they need to work at scale, you know, and they need to be scalable. They need to be able to be spread out through multiple properties. And so I think that's some, you know, cool stuff that I think Brandon and I have in common. Um, I have one of Elaine's uh, studies that I really like going over. I don't know if we have the time or bandwidth to go through a study, but that might be kind of cool. <laughs> we got all uh, sorts of time. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So, but yeah, I just, you know, I was really impressed with some of the things that Brandon had to say. And it's, you know, it's clear he's, you know, doing a lot of the same things that I am. But then I think there's two very different aspects about our cultivation styles in that, you know, I went heavy on the biological analysis to deal with some of the issues and get improvement at scale. And Brandon went kind of the other way with the saturated paste test, which I do and I do the test, but I always, you know, personally, I kind of focus more on the biological stuff. So I think that's really interesting how it sounds like we've come to some of the same conclusions and areas of success through two different lanes, you know, so I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, the, the, all the testing methods is, you know, in, in my opinion, like the, uh, the best results that I've seen as far as maximizing, um, each cultivar. Mm -hmm. right. what? Cause in this, in this early stage, we have to find a balance between, you know, using our intuition and using some of the data points. And I think, you know, personally, I feel that the more data points you're able to take, the, the, the better you can farm organically. We have a Brandon, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm just having some problems. Just give me one second. No worries. Scott, you can monologue for a minute. Well, why don't, why don't we jump into the Elaine stuff you were talking about while Brandon's uh, troubleshooting? Okay. Um, should I pull it up and do a share screen or? Yeah. Okay, let me... Clear up all my. Uh, <laughs> the well, stuff I, to, uh, I was <laughs> the all embarrassing ready. stuff. Yeah, I was all ready for zooming, and uh, we're in a new era of StreamYard, so I had yeah. to uh, download some stuff. Let me go to the top page here. I was rereading this earlier today. And look okay. who's back. Whoops. Let's see. Uh, select window or screen. Uh, we'll do an entire screen. Yeah, and then just, and then then just do. To the, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all okay. up in the game this year in all kinds of different areas. Okay, so we share screening. Yep. Yeah, okay, so here we go. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Uh, so this is a paper that was written by Dr. Lane um, and actually her husband. Her husband, Russell, is a nematologist. I don't think many people know that, but. Um, Back in the early years of kind of the soul food web before the online schools, it was very difficult to come in contact with much of Elaine's work. And, um, you know, in one of the years when I was, you know, tracking her down like a, like a Grateful Dead show, I pulled her aside after a composting event and, and just kind of asked her like, you know, where can I come in contact with more of your work? Um, 
and sh and she said you should start with ecological monograph 1985 and so i wrote that down and i went back and tried searching tried searching and had a really hard time finding because if you type in dr elaine ingham ecological monograph you literally get thousands of responses and so you know this paper was kind of also my journey really into some of the scientific literature um, and it took me a couple weeks of searching with no no luck to find this paper and eventually i contacted a buddy that was an undergraduate program in the biological studies told him what i was looking for he went to the school library and came back with like 12 of dr lane's pages and our papers and this was one of them so according to dr lane you know this is where a lot of the the basis for her work comes and one of the reasons i had a hard time finding this i was searching ecological monograph which is the publication it's found within but the title of the paper is actually Interactions of Bacteria, Fungi, and Their Nematode Grazers, Effects on Nutrient Cycling and Plant Growth. And so prior to this 1985 paper, there was a lot of, um, a lot of measurements that had been taken, but there wasn't a lot showing the effects of plant growth. So there was respiration rates, CO2 production, nitrogen production, things like that. And so the real goal of this, this paper was to try and quantify the effects of, on plant growth of the different type of assemblies of organisms. And so when you get to a scientific publication, a lot of times there are two or three pages. Uh, this one is like 22 pages. So it's quite long for a, a, um, a peer reviewed study, but they all kind of have the same, same deal. They'll have a title, they'll tell you who's involved with it, and then they'll give you an abstract. And so the abstract is usually a couple paragraphs giving an idea of really what they're after. Um, in this example, they did two. Um, they did two different groups. They did amended and unamended. So the amended group uh, was was given chitin in the form of a uh, crustacean meal, I believe. And then for each of the groups, they um, they uh, you know sterilized soil, planted grass seeds, and then re-inoculated with different combination of organisms. So sterile plant, plant with bacteria plant with bacteria and fungi, plant with bacteria, bacterial feeding nematodes, plant, bacteria, fungi, fungal feeding nematodes. And then they took various uh, measurements over uh, the course of um, 105 days, I believe. Um, so I kind of went through and highlighted some of the things that really stuck out to me when I first read this that I think really sent me on the journey that I'm on now. Um, just, just quickly, Scott, are you on a Mac? Yes, sir. Can, can you can you do the command plus to make it bigger, like the? Yep. How about that? Yep. Per yeah. Look at that. Now we can actually read yeah. it. So, like I that said, is. there's a ton, there's a ton going on in this. I don't really want to kind of get through all of it. I encourage you to read it if you'd like. Um, when I first got this, it did take me like two and a half weeks to really define things and really understand what I was reading. Um, but there was a couple things that really stuck out, and I tried to just quickly highlight some of those. Um, and so in this section, they're talking about, um, sorry, I'll try to not scroll so bad, my bad, um, but kind of the introduction. And so um, this part I've highlighted here, it says when either amoebae, so that's the predator of bacteria, or bacteriophagic nematodes, which means nematodes that eat bacteria, whenever those were in in introduced to some of the microcosms, nearly all the immobilized nitrogen was remineralized while less than one third of the ammonia nitrogen was returned in the treatment with bacteria alone. After 24 days, significantly more phosphorus was remineralized in the bacteria and nematode treatment than in either the treatment with bacteria alone or bacteria and amoeba treatment. In a similar study, more nitrogen was remineralized as ammonia nitrogen in the amoeba plus bacteria treatment than in a treatment containing bacteria alone. A treatment with nematodes and bacteria or one with nematodes, amoeba and bacteria. And so some kind of definitions here that kind of pop their way mm -hmm. through this paper is the first one is immobilized. And so mobilizing is when a soil organism holds a nutrient inside of its body. Uh, remineralizing is when um, organic matter is broken down into its simple inorganic forms. And so we're talking about the capturing of nutrients inside of a bacterial body. We're talking about um, large compounds being broken down into amino acids and, and um, basic inorganic compounds. Um, and essentially, they're just trying to say, you know, what happens on a nutrient standpoint when all these combinations get together. So in this study as well, 
They also measured um, contents of nitrogen and phosphorus in the uh, plant itself, the above ground biomass, and they also measured it in the soil periodically. Um, but you can start to see that they've um, got many different combinations going on here. Um, so that's why I had to back up. Let me back it up so I can get to my... Um, so there's lots of different sections. Like I said, this is 22 pages. Most of these pages are talking about previous work, what they found, and what they hope to find with this given study. Um, here's kind of a drawing of what happens when, um, you know, a bacterial feeding nematode eats a bacteria and kind of what that conversion is. It's a little bit confusing, honestly, but um, here's some other points. So the, this current study examines the interactions of the biota represented in the model in order to substantiate previous observations under more rigorously controlled conditions and with a more complex assemblage of organisms, including plants. Nitrogen and phosphorus mineralization were examined in two model soil systems, one in which soil was unamended and one in which chitin was used as a representative organic nitrogen substrate. Bacteria, fungi, and nematode grazers of these mycoflora were chosen from isolates to represent functional groups. And so they're just kind of explaining what they're going to do. They explain the two um, sample groups. One is amended with chitin. One is not amended with chitin. And then of those two sample groups, they all have the same different assemblages of plants, which is um, described here. And so they have a sterile plant control. They have plant with bacteria, PB plant bacteria and a bacterial feeding nematode, PBNB. Then you have plant and fungus, plant fungus, and a fungus eating nematode. Um, each treatment was replicated five times and sampled after 40 days with a total of a 100 day sample. And so, you know, in a lot of these papers, they start to describe what's about to go down, um, all their different methods, um, which is usually what I like to read. Um, before I even get too much into the paper, I like to read what is it they were trying to do. Um, and that'll usually determine um, if I bother reading it. But um, so then they start to get to the results. So they start to get into some of the data of the um, of the experiment itself. So like I said, they measured the shoot and root biomass. And so at periodic times throughout the um, uh 105 days, they would clip off the above ground biomass of the grass, they would weigh it, they would separate the roots from the soil and weigh the roots, which was kind of interesting. Um, and so here they're saying shoot production, meaning the above ground grass biomass, was significantly higher in treatments with bacterial feeding nematodes or with fungus than in the sterile plant control or in a plant and bacteria treatment. In addition, the most biologically complex treatment, so plant, bacteria, fungi, bacterial feeding nematode and fungal feeding nem nematode had more shoot biomass than all of the other treatments. Um, and root production was significantly higher in the plant with fungal treatment than any other treatment, which is actually kind of interesting. And so throughout this entire study, there was different times in the 105 days and with different assemblages of organisms that different outcomes happened. And so, you know, you know they had the greatest above ground biomass with the most complex treatment but root production seemed to be higher in the plant and fungi, you know? And so from that, as somebody that was reading this, it says, okay, this is a correlation back to my hydroponic days where, you know, if the fungal component of the soil is increasing oxygen and root zone and pore space, um, then that allows for greater root growth, just like in a hydroponic system that has more aeration. And so, you know, a lot of this was starting to really kind of like unravel some things that were misunderstood for me. And, and um, you know where to go from there. Uh, there's a lot of tables here. These tables are speaking about, um, they actually went through and measured um, the organisms um, in the root zone and then outside of the root zone. So they actually quantified, um, uh, you know, how, how, how many organisms were at different places in the soil. Um, this is where I really started to get turned on to nematodes and, and where I could find them and where we could introduce them into the cultivation space back in 2015, 2016 when we were doing this. Um, and they found that both treatments that included nematodes had significantly higher bacterial numbers than the treatment with only bacteria. And the highest bacterial densities were in the plant bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode, which is kind of interesting because further down in this paper, it actually explains how a nematode eating bacteria actually can lead to higher populations of bacteria, 
which is really fascinating. Um, they go on to explain why they think that was. Um, part of it is they carry them around through different resources. Not all the bacteria die inside the nematode, but it just, you know, to me really showed there's some wild, wild things that go on with the soil food web. Um, and so here is saying that all treatments with bacterial feeding nematodes or fungi contain significantly more ammonia nitrogen, which is the bloom formula, uh, than the sterile plant control or just plant bacteria. And so it's showing again that there's some benefits to trying to make the soil food web assemblages more um, complex. Um, so here's the thing about chitin. A lot of people know about chitin or chitinase products. Um, in the chitin amended, um, or well, I guess it says in all treatments with the chitin decomposers, so the fungi, you know, root, root biomass was always greater than in the treatment without the organisms. So we're seeing an impact on root growth by adding some of the beneficial fungi. Um, let's see here. Um, there's a bunch of different graphs. So they, they um, did shoot biomass, which in my other slides, I have a little cleanup version. Sometimes these are hard to read because you got to sort out through the um, through the uh, different um, symbols for each thing. And so here's shoot biomass, root biomass across the different um, timelines. Uh, more graphs. So this is hypha length, and then they were doing some staining of the hyphae. So then they started measuring the, the uh, nutrients in the soil. In this particular uh, study, they did nitrogen and phosphorus. And it says all, all plant treatments immobilized P, meaning phosphorus was inside organism bodies, with the least immobilization in the sterile plant and plant with just bacteria, and the most rapid initial mobilization in the plant bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode. And so you're seeing, um, a more rapid absorption and containment of those nutrients when they added a bacterial feeding nematode. Um, by the end of the experiment, however, the plant values were similar for the um, these different assemblages. When I finally got the opportunity to meet Dr. Lane and um, sit down and have some beers over dinner with her, I asked her some of these things. And essentially what they found was, you know, they were trying to grow grass in a Petri dish over 105 days. And so some of the stuff leveled out towards the end of experiment. When I asked her about that, um, she said, you know, if you did this in a larger soil volume, then some of these things that equaled out at the end definitely wouldn't equal out at the end. But in, in respect to be an appropriate scientific study, you know, they put they put that stuff in there. Um, what was interesting then, too, is you see a variation of when some of these nutrients start to become available in the different um, assemblages of organisms. That's what this is talking about. So. Ammonium nitrogen increased slightly between days nine and 21 in the uninoculated control and then remained constant for the rest of the experiment. Uh, meaning more nitrogen wasn't being produced in that sample without organisms. And so, you know, if you happen to catch Brandon's last uh, episode where he was talking about the differences between the Malik 3 test and the saturated paste test, he was mentioning that because of the introduction of his phosphorus solubilizing organisms, you're seeing an increase of available phosphate on the saturated paste test when it might not be showing up on the Malik 3. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting thing that I think this study is seeing as well. Um, um, and so the most, they saw the most rapid immobilization, so the most rapid creation and containment of nutrients within an organism body uh, happened in, where there was something eating something else. So we have a plant bacteria and a bacterial feeding nematode, and then we have a plant bacteria, fungi, and fungal feeding nematode. And so you're seeing, um, you know, a lot of flowering nitrogen being produced when something is eating something else. Hey, Scott, just a quick question from the uh, peanut gallery. Sharon asked, did the chitin impact nematode population in Elaine's study? Um, you know, I have to go through and read this. Mostly what it talked about was um, increasing available nutrients and, uh, and increasing available biomass. Um, I could read some of these a little bit more um, specifically and then drop those in the comments after. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of talk about effects with nematodes. 
Um, there's probably two pages, just two full pages talking about the impacts of nematodes. Um, but right off the top of my head in this moment, I don't know that I have the answer for that. Um, but here's one, it says, you know, the most significant increases in available flowering nitrogen, plant growth, and plant available nitrogen occurred when bacterial feeding nematodes or fungi was present. So um, it didn't necessarily say that there was an increase here, but it's saying that the, uh, the effects of the increase of fungi, so the fungi are producing the ammonia nitrogen or the flowering nitrogen, those are being um, increased when um, something is eating something else. And then, um, so this is just an interesting thing where they took from previous research and talked about what all these different organisms do, which is kind of interesting, um, which I think uh, Brandon was talking about in the last episode too, like you're seeing uh, CO2 respiration, you're seeing movement of nitrogen phosphorus. And so here's um, a lot of times in these peer-reviewed studies, they'll do full uh, work cited of anything they read or incorporated. And so that's what this is all about with respect to the different organisms they um, had in the sample. Um, oops, I think there was one more here. Uh, and I think this is where like I really, you know, things for me really started to click and really this was where I became quite obsessed with the soul food web essentially. But so now here they're talking about increases in nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, in the short term unamended study, there was net N, so net nitrogen immobilization, meaning no increase in the plant and pla plant bacteria treatments as the plants took up the limited available nitrogen in the soil while little to no nitrogen was being created or mineralized. And in the treatments with fungi and or bacterial feeding nematodes, however, there was more nitrogen mineralized than the plants could take up, even though there was a greater and more rapid plant growth in these more biologically complex treatments. And so this paragraph told me, you know, the basis for why Dr. Lane makes some of the claims that she makes, not necessarily saying that I agree with them, but this is based in why she makes the claims that mineral analysis and mineral mending isn't needed is because here we have a situation where bacterial feeding nematodes were introduced and far more nitrogen than could be taken up in the plant was produced. And that's pretty profound, you know, um, saying that, you know, even though nitrogen was going into the plant, they were measuring it in the plant, there was still far more produced than even the plant was taking up and it showed an increase um, in the soil. And so here they're talking about nitrogen released by the nematodes. It says, while appreciable N was released by nematodes in the plant bacteria, bacterial feeding nematode treatment, the amount was insufficient to explain all the early increase in plant nitrogen as compared with plants from the plant bacteria treatment. For example, on day 21, 647 micrograms of nitrogen were found in plants from the plant bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode treatment, while plant bacteria plants contained 175 micrograms of nitrogen, a difference of 472 micrograms. Uh, by this time, only 269 micrograms nitrogen had been released by the nematodes. So they're saying something else has to be going on here. Um, and I think it's fair in some of these scientific studies to say that they found something, but they don't necessarily have the answer. And so their, their, their theory is that, um, you know, for the additional nitrogen uptake by the plant, several factors should be considered. First, the bacterial populations on day 21 were 25 times greater in the plant bacterial bacterial feeding nematode treatment than in just the plant bacterial alone. And so when they went through periodically through the study, they were counting soil organisms and they saw 25 times more bacteria when there was a, a grazer or something that eats it in that treatment, which is pretty interesting. Um, and so the chitin decomp, then they're making an assumption that chitin decomposition by bacteria was probably much greater in the treatment with the nematodes. Second, since both bacteria and nematodes were concentrated in the rhizosphere, so in the root zone, much of the nitrogen mineralized by either bacteria or nematodes was probably in close proximity to the roots available for immediate uptake, which makes sense, right? So the organisms are living in the rhizosphere or on the roots. They're eating each other, which is releasing nutrients, and it's available for immediate uptake. Uh, this more advantageous nitrogen regime was probably reasonable or responsible for more rapid root growth in the early plant bacteria, bacterial feeding nematode treatment. The greater root biomass was then able to exploit a larger soil volume, 
and reach soil inorganic nitrogen not available to the roots in just the plant bacteria treatment. Uh, this was primarily responsible for the differences between these treatments in ammonia nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen levels, which were not which were noted in the first half of the experiment. Therefore, it seems likely that the Pleiodera species, so the bacteria they inoculated with, had an important positive feedback early in the experiment. Uh, root biomass between the two treatments was no longer different at day 49, yet plants in the plant bacteria bacterial feeding nematode treatment contained 813 micrograms more N than those in the plant bacteria treatment. By this time, nematodes had excreted 1,491 micrograms of nitrogen per ecosystem or, or petri dish, which may have accounted for much of the additional plant nitrogen that they measured, although some of the nematode excreted nitrogen was undoubtedly you know, taken up or immobilized by the bacteria. Um, this paragraph right here sent me on a crazy mission for bacterial feeding nematodes, which back in 2015, 2016, it just was very difficult um, to come into those. So uh, yeah, so as pretty interesting stuff. Um, I don't know if any of that made sense to everybody um, or if it helped, but I guess for me, what this did for me on my journey was it showed there was a tremendous value to putting something into the system to eat anything else, whether it be um, a bacteria feeding nematode eating a bacteria or a fungal feeding nematode eating a fungi, uh, which from the time I read this paper in like 20, 15, 2015, 2016, yeah, 2015. Um, it would it would be like three years before I would see an actual fungal feeding nematode in a client garden. It took a long time to get there. Um, but what we found was you could order bacterial feeding nematodes on the internet. Um, most people are familiar with the Steiner Nema uh, predatory nematodes, so the SF and the SC nematodes. Um, but if you get the Heterabditis or the HB, um, those are very voracious bacterial feeding nematodes. Even though they're sold as a pest predator, they eat a ton of bacteria, which leads to a very measurable increase in yield, which we started seeing in the commercial space. And a lot of cultivators, um, a lot of cultivators complain about the um, they complain about the um, track and trace phenomenon. But track and trace told us a lot about our 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 property because you're getting a per plant yield, you're getting a per zone yield. And we started getting hired early in 2016 because farms were using predatory nematodes to control pests. And then the track and trace would show there was a extreme disparagement between yield across the facility. And so a lot of those farms hired us to try and figure out why it was. Um, what we saw was in the samples where year yield was considerably higher, there was a tremendous amount of the bacterial feeding nematodes that they were using as a pest control measure. And so, you know, that, that was some pretty light bulb moments for us back in the early years of really trying to figure out because at that time, suitable compost for this process really wasn't around. Um, at that time, you had to make a thermal pile like Dr. Lane talks about to get some of these organisms. You know, all the bagged compost was almost exclusively bacteria. There was a couple brands that might have some protozoa, you know, some flagellate and amoebes, most often amoebae, which are the one of the predators of bacteria, look like a millennium falcon, I guess. And so, you know, I was kind of on the search, like, how do we get these things into the system? Um, and at that time, by far the easiest way was to add the HB nematodes to the system. And then, so now, so now you're taking bacteria, which is the potential for, for plant growth or, or the storage of plant nutrients. And then you put something in there that eats it and it all becomes available. I'm looking in the, uh, I'm going to throw some comments up and you guys can just, uh, no. either confirm or, uh, Don oh, says blue well. oyster mycelium will munch the nematodes. Um, okay. It's a fair answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And then <laughs> it's so funny the comments some of these clowns have for Elaine. It's like y'all need to put some respect on her name. Like y'all talking shit on Elaine, and we can't. You can't even read through that paper. That's, She's uh, not that's this <laughs> guy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like look, people are clowny. Get that out of here. 
talking about science. Yeah, I'm blowing past. Uh, yeah, he was talking about five different trophic types of nematode. Yeah, so totally. Yeah, so there's good and bad nematodes, but you know, I believe the work that Dr. Lane says that the root feeding nematodes exist under decreased oxygen conditions, and so if we avoid that, then we avoid their habitat at all. Um, and I would say in all of our cannabis experience, which has been a lot. You know, there's been less than five facilities that have root feeding nematodes. Normally you see those come in on um, soil brands that are made with municipal compost, but usually you don't, you don't see those too much in the soilless, soilless mixes, honestly. Um, we do see them, but they're very rare. Um, as far as the blue oyster mycelium, we don't necessarily use the blue oyster. Um, and there, there is a mushroom that, that will catch nematodes. You know, it's always the one that shows like the, uh, it's like the, the lasso around it, but that's catching root feeding nematodes. So I don't, I don't know that the mycelium itself would kill the nematodes. But yeah. So what was, um, you, you and Brandon had started talking about something when, uh, Brandon's, uh, video crapped out oh yeah well i just i think like what's interesting is you know how, the different strategies that we've taken so i've i've worked on organism assemblages and then brandon's worked on chemistry to to uh, achieve the same net result and so you know there might be some interesting similarities between the results that both of us have found from you know from two different strategies Um, I use biologicals. I inoculate weekly at the facility with uh, probiotics, and I also do different combinations at certain times nice. for certain effects. Um, so my my kind of take on it, I'm I'm not to be completely honest, I'm not really familiar with Dr. Lang Ingham's mm -hmm. uh, work. I haven't read a lot of her stuff, or I haven't taken any of her courses and stuff. I know who she is, obviously you know, leader and the proponent of soil food web science. Um, for me, I, uh, I started, you know, when I started doing organic cultivation and I was doing the probiotics, it kind of led from there. And then finding science that's uh, applicable uh, and functional is one of the things that's, I guess, the hardest. Um, because a lot of these studies, if you look at the methods of what they're doing, a lot of them are taking measurements from like field agronomy. Mm -hmm. um, I've said this before. Um, so you have to be able to try to translate uh, how these things function in a modified system that's not actually soil. It hasn't been weathered by nature. It doesn't contain sand, silt, or clay. These things uh, function uh, very, very similar uh, but when you take away, uh, you know, the abiotic stress factors by having a controlled environment, it's more like you're culturing, um, like mushrooms, for instance, or culturing something in a bacterial incubator. Essentially, you're making a huge incubator for the, the type of biology. Um, and I use a combination of the biologicals with the with the testing and i know that most research that i've read will say that having a uh, a larger biodiversity of microorganisms will uh it it shows that usually the best overall results um a lot of these are um, doing experiments with like field agronomy in which case, you know, you can't create perfect environments or you can't can create perfect like nutritional uh, like soil fertility targets um, to start with. <laughs> so, you know, my, the, the stuff that I'm doing right now, it's really progressive because I have to make sure that I maintain balance within these systems. Um, and I do use a lot of the biologicals and until I can actually get, you know, testing done on what those are in the soil, then I won't know for sure. But I know 100% like 
what I'm inoculating with. I know that the bacteria I'm using that source from, you know, a biotechnology company, I know exactly what I'm putting into the system, what, it, what it's, you know, what the, what it should be promoting. Um, but I think without being able to genetically test these things that it becomes kind of difficult, um, at least for me to know specifically, because I'm not so much relying on, although the, the bacteria and the consortiums that I use, they do outcompete pathogens and cycle nutrients. I'm not solely relying on those uh, to get the plant what it needs. Um, I'm doing that by making sure that things are kind of balanced and that things when they fall into solution uh, are at a good, a good number. Um, some of that is due. Some of those numbers are byproducts of the uh, inoculations. Um, but my main focus when it comes to biological crop steering, uh, the method that I'm using is actually focusing on the metabolites of, the, of certain types of consortiums, um, because that's really where you get the benefit. If you're getting a, an organism that's producing like an auxin compound, it's going to have a physiological effect on the plant itself. Um, if you're getting microorganisms, uh, microorganisms uh, that create society of force uh, that are, you know, iron chelating compounds, and you're making iron biologically available in soils, that's going to have a physiological effect on the plant because, you know, iron is one of the heaviest metals in soils and it's one of the hardest for the plant to accumulate. Um, so there's, you know, I have an idea of what I want. And if as more science emerges, and I find out what type of metabolites are being produced by the different types of microbes. My next question is, okay, if this microbe is producing this, does this microbe play nicely with these other microbes? And if the answer is yes, they do play nicely, then I then I experiment to see um, if the end result is, uh, is better. Nice. I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the things I really liked about your last episode was how you said that, you know, we need to take into account scientific research, but not all the stuff in vitro or in the lab, as they say, you know, translates well to the practical cultivation space. And yeah. so, you know, I, I think keeping a balance between what we read in a study in a Petri dish, uh, what we do in the real world, maintaining that balance is very important. Um, I will say though, like in our, in our experience, you know, what, what is found in the ecological monograph is, um, you know, translates to the real world quite well. As far as playing nice, we do see some weird things with competition, like, um, uh, the, the SF, SC, so the Steiner Nema, predatory nematodes, and nematodes. If you inoculate them at the same time, usually one of them lasts because they're competing for the same resources. And so when we really track these things over time in permanent soils, even though we inoculate with the SF or SC and, and always the HB, um, you do start to see one of those end up as the predominant species and then you start to re-inoculate again and that's uh, kind of how it is with the biologicals and one of the reasons why that i inoculate continuously because i want them to be able to produce the same chemical compounds but also because there's dieback you know these things as you know as time persists they'll go and they'll reach just kind of natural levels right unfortunately some of these natural levels aren't uh, going to facilitate the rapid growth of these plants, especially again, if you've taken out the abiotic stress factors and your VPD is on point and everything is dialed in as far as your environment goes, um, you have proper lighting. If everything is fully dialed in, right? The, the growth rate that you, that I have always seen is that these, that the, uh, plant needs a little bit more now the soils will feed these things with for the majority of the inputs but things like calcium get used so quickly because calcium is you know it carries every, it carries so much of the of the other elements with it when it when it's absorbed you know when the plant uptakes these 
from the soil. So calcium is depleted really, really rapidly. So is potassium. And, you know, potassium is one of the things that, you know, that has to be mineralized into a form that's usable. And unless, and a lot of times I, I see really low potassium levels because the amount of potassium that ca cannabis requires. Um, and so there are certain types of species that will help, um, you know, uh, make those biological, they'll mineralize them, break them down, and make, make them available. Um, but not at the speeds that I see that. So, you know, for me, being able to know that, like, you know, I have a, I have the soil mm -hmm. test, right? And I can see what's in the soil. Like, okay, this could be low or it could be adequate, but it's not really until I see how it falls into solution that I can see, okay, well, I could actually use a little bit more in the soil because it's not, you know, falling into solution or, you know, some things are available, are better available when your VPD is in better range or, you know, lower ranges, higher ranges. The availability um, of some of the nutrients are going to be dependent on the ability for that plant to continually uh, transpire, you know. Right. Um, so there's all these different factors that play in. So it's, it, it, for me, it can be really hard to determine. And that's why I've been building like constant data sets over the last year for the target levels. We have the soil at Majestic Craft Cannabis. Um, it is at a level where everything is at target range and all the focus is really just dialing in, um, I mean, uh, balancing everything and then uh, dialing in through the tissue testing because I can see how it falls into solution from the soil and then I can see how the plant is actually absorbing it and if the levels are adequate or not enough and little thing, little tweaks can actually be made just with like my, like the amount of minerals that we're actually talking about when, when I'm talking about like top dressing and adding these minerals in um we're talking about like uh um, such a minute amount you know uh teaspoons or tablespoons per per yard of soil so if you have an entire yard of soil you might only be using two teaspoons of of a mineral mm -hmm. we're not talking a lot we're talking about really small minute adjustments to maximize you know, these things, uh, potential, you know, and make sure that things aren't going above too. So, you know, I think that it will be possible in the future to be able to make adjustments like that using biology, but what it, what we're going to have to focus on is the different consortiums that, uh, release those metabolites. Like, cause one of them, for instance, is, is phosphatase, right? It's a, it's a enzyme in it, in it, breaks down uh, uh it breaks down uh you know minerals that are uh that are phosphorus it breaks down phosphorus from uh, minerals you know um there's other things like um you know reductase compounds or again cytophores or different type of organic acids amino acids that act as chelation compounds i think uh if i'm not mistaken i think uh, glutamic, glutamic acid. One of the one of the amino acids is very, very. It's an extremely, extremely strong binding agent. And so the induction of amino acids is one of the things that I'm using too. Um, well, I'm doing uh, more experiments with different types of microbes to, and then I'm able to, since I already have my uh, soil fertility uh, on point with all the testing. I can dial in the cultivars to see where they are. And after I have all those data sets, I can just run everything with a, like basically an SOP. Like if I start at uh, uh, this point at the very beginning, I'll know that on a weekly schedule, I'll need to introduce these types of biologicals at this point. I'll need to mineralize at this point um, or I'll need to add, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but then I can actually look you know, my end goal would be I 
love to be able to find out exactly which uh, organisms work best synergistically together. So that way you can, so we can, can continue to decrease uh, the inputs and just maximize the cycling capacity of oils at the different points for the different things. If we know that we need um, you know, a little more like boron or something, okay, what do we know of anything that is going to be able to solubilize that or make that more bioavailable and, and then what are those things? So those are the, those are the focus. Like, if I know I need something when we have proper levels to get just a little instead of adding neuro, can we add biological? And those are kind of, you know, why with it? What can I do to keep improving? And it's being able to translate the, the papers. That's been the thing. That's been one of the most difficult things because there's a lot of good work, a lot of good research. It's all about, but it's all about does this actually function? Does it have functionality in a cultivation system for cannabis and at scale, right? Because if if you can if you can like let's say you're you're a cannabis farmer, a legacy cannabis farmer, an investor comes to you and they come say, Hey, we want to do this, but we have X amount of it. being able to decrease the cost is huge, especially so you might be spending a little bit of money on testing for doing the soil that, but you're literally like cutting out dude thousands and thousands thousands of dollars on the cost of but to cultivate like that you're reaching soil continuously mm -hmm. you have all these benefits that go along with it um je, 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 just quick yeah hold that up uh and then i was gonna cut your video so that your audio comes through better but what uh hold it up yeah we can't really see it but yeah what does it say this is a study of biostimulant action of protein hydrolytes, um, unraveling their effects on plant physiology and microbiome. This is a really, really good research, and this is one of the reasons why um, I actually don't worry about any type of nitrogen source other than the acid nitrogen. J j just quickly, Brandon, c can you kill your video for a little bit so that your audio is uh, getting all the bandwidth? Yeah. Oh, there we go. And uh, can you hear me all right? That yeah. is much better. Yeah. I did have a bird that was screaming in the background. So it might, that might have been. That's definitely you had, it. You, you had what streaming in the background? The show? No, my, my, my macaw, he was screaming in the other room. Oh, so, got it, got it. He can be really loud when he wants to be. Um, so one of the interesting things about. Uh, about the uh, the amino acids is it don't, not only stimulates plant morphology, um, but it also stimulates the biome. So I have found the combination of um, amino acids and biology uh, just has a massive, a massive impact. It's night and day. You can see it visually. Um, and one of the things I think is a lot of times I think people run out of energy, you know, and you can, you know, towards the end of uh, the, the cycles because a lot of people start off nitrogen and seen is that you have a certain, uh, if you cut that, that availability, you know, like, I think we've all seen that, that diagram, right? With the bucket that's over once you have one thing that, not in balance or level, you know, it can, it can only progress far. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one of the things in using acid nitrogen, it's really interesting because what you're in the plant is a biological amino acid that's available is a by and then that byproduct of this amino acid uh, hydrolyzation process is a biological form of nitrogen that's immediately available, immediately available for foiler sprays, and then you're also getting the acids. And then when you're, I always, you know, if you're giving the 
something that's going to biosynthesize anyway. It's going to expend less energy, and it's going to have more energy for other me metabolic processes. Uh, if, if I'm working uh, on my office here together, and I'm putting together all of the research papers that are kind of a pool to cannabis, and I'm going to put them in my Dropbox, on that Dropbox public for me. Um, but it's going to take me a little while because I have to start everything out. Uh, and another thing, too, is things that I tried to research a lot of times, I it's something that I don't see is modified growing mixes or like living soils. I don't see a lot of science coming out of um, uh, uh, that are geared that were just for these modified growing mixes. Uh, and the reason is, I think, is because these things are fairly new because of the rise in, you know, cannabis agriculture. There's more interest being taken, so I think that as we move forward, there's going to be a lot more science on these on these types of mixes and how they function. Uh, and hopefully, I can bring you guys some of that science. But um, again, a lot of this stuff is just is transferring over science that's that's functional in these spaces. Functionality is key. J just quickly, Brandon, can you um, quit? and and start your phone up guys your your audio is super robotic uh but as someone said it's the uh smartest robot that they've what was the comment sometimes it's a very you, smart sounding robot if you have somebody playing video games or something in the next room over or something have them cut it all off that happens the your team to get back to work and stop playing video games <laughs> exactly that always happens with Eric. His kids plays the video game. It cuts out, you know. <laughs> okay, so I turned off my Wi-Fi. There you go. Do I sound all right? You yeah. sound much better. All right, now now you could even bring the video yeah, back if you want. On. Yeah, go back to amino acids. Okay. Oh so yeah, God. so I have I actually have uh, a bunch of paper stuff, uh, a bunch of papers that I have prepared because I have a booth set up for Bokashi Earthworks at the Cowboy Cup out here nice. in Oklahoma. So I have a bunch of stuff. Um, so if you're in the if you're in Oklahoma and you're going to go out there, come see me. Um, so you know, one of the things that is coming really clear to me after going through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers is that. It seems like bacteria kind of drives all living systems um, and not just like what's in the soil, but also what's on the phylosphere, what's in the uh, uh, what's the, the endophatic bacteria. And it's because they have the ability to create chemical compounds in the plant that can be utilized and they have the ability to, you know, change, you know, DNA uh, coding and they, they just do all kinds of insane, crazy things. And a lot of the the functions of, of a lot of these different types are just being, you know, discovered. So, um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the funnest things for me is to be able to find all the, all the cool new stuff that's been discovered and see if, uh, it translates into anything that I'm doing. Because again, my whole goal is to be able to show people, uh, and showcase organic cultivation and say, Hey, look, this is a more cost effective method um, and it is, you know, uh, I, in my opinion, a higher, you can create a higher quality as far as, you know, the, the complete overall profile of the plant when we talk about, you know, terpenes, cannabinoids, flavonoids, um, and the other things. Okay, so biostimulant action of protein hydrolysates. Um, it talks about how the different protein hydrolysates actually stimulate the microbiome to help kind of diversify things. And, uh, and it just kind of, there, it, it, it does, it has a lot of different functions, right? So a lot of these amino acids chelate things and make things more biologically available, things that may not have been there. They increase biological activity, at least for a certain period while these things are being sequestered, which will, uh, help kind of uh, drive the nutrient cycling. And we're talking about not just in these modified mixes, but 
this is for, uh, you know, agronomic uh, field conditions as well. Um, and so the continual use of these things, they can actually help build up biomass in the form of biology, right? And, you know, what will end up happening is these things will peter out, they'll die, they'll, they'll break down, anything that they had stored in their bodies, like you talked about before, will, will essentially become bioavailable. They also, um, you know, when you can get uh, a nitrogen source that's so readily available, it helps increase root biomass of the different plants as well, which is going to help increase the aeration content, and that's going to increase the uh, gas exchange in these types of soils as well. Um, so if, you know, these are... Uh, and then really interesting, too, because these amino acids, they not only have these, these properties that are associated with them, but a lot of them can be used to build up larger complex protein chains, you know, um, and a lot of them can be uh, turned into other chemical compounds. You know, some of these are precursors to... Uh, to things like uh, hormones, you know, that, that might be secreted. And, and here's an interesting thing too. So some of the metabolites that are secreted by these bacteria and fungi, and all, by all these soil microorganisms, uh, some of these things, you know, are, are hormones as well too that have physiological effects that are being, you know, that are, you know, being introduced into the, uh, the plant system. Um, so it's been shown uh, that these really help, that amino acids help with uh, germination, uh, plant growth and productivity, uh, crop, uh, not just yields, but actual quality. And it's mostly due to the, uh, again, I, I think it's really due to the fact that when you give something, you know, something that it's going to already use that expend energy to create and you get to it readily, it's going to be able to focus of its other processes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been shown to have, you know, better quality uh, produce as well as higher yields using the uh, amino acids, the hydrolysates. Um, and then the uh, the plant associated microbiome, you know, the 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 increase in biology is is exponential when you use these things. And it's not only that, but we go into like, for instance, you know, uh, soy hydrolysate has nineteen of like I think twenty or twenty one essential amino acids for all life. And then we get into like specific amino acids like glutamate, which is the one that I was thinking of earlier. And that is one of the hot has one of the highest chelation um, uh, and bonding capacities. So it can really, really help make so much stuff that's in the soil bioavailable. It's uh, very similar to the way that humic and fulvic acids work. Um, so there's another one. Uh, this is another paper on amino acids, and it's called, it's titled uh, ex uh, Exogenous Glutamate Rapidly Induces the Expression of Genes Involved in Metabolism and the Fonts. And they talk about this, and they're going over, you know, obviously these aren't cannabis papers, right? So I look across the board, and a lot of times if something is trying to, you know, some, some of these are specific to specific crops. Um, but if we look at the, the way that nature functions, a lot of things, these are transferable, or at least I believe that a lot of these things um, are transferable in, in just the way that they operate. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, certain amino acids will do different things. There's another one called amino acids, catabolism in plants. And it's the ability for these plants to sequester and take in these amino acids and build them into complex proteins. The things, you know, pre some of the uh, terpenes uh, are, you know, the precursors. They have to, you know, they have to take amino acids first. And they, they're built in different, 
you know, carbon, uh, carbon blocks. And then they're, they go through all these different chemical changes within the plant. Amino acids really help uh, facilitate a lot of the different, you know, catabolism and uh, building blocks of all the different functions in there. So, I mean, if I'll have all these available, but a lot of these talks about, you know, um, you know, pool sizes of protein, uh, uh, protein bound proteins and amino acids in plants. They talk about pathways, the different pathways that the different chemical constituents take and what they're, you know, converted into, what chemicals, you know, because we know that these plants produce wide, that plants produce wide range of chemical constituents, you know, so. You know, having the ability to have all these different amino acids available, I think just broadens the the ability to, for the plant to make a lot uh, of these chemical constituents more efficiently. Mm -hmm. nice. And here's one, uh, like proline, right? That's an amino acid. It acts as an osmolite and a chemical uh, chaperone and is therefore accumulated by plants under various stress conditions. Its catabolism takes place in the mitochondria and the process is via two oxidation steps to glutamate. Proline, proline dehydrogenase converts proline to another chemical, which is also produced by the transmutation of orthiamine. And, uh, you know, it talk, it, so they're talking about these different, um, they're talking about all these different chemical reactions within the plant. And then it eventually oxidizes to what's called P5C, then to glutamate, which is another amino acid. Amino acid, again, that glutamate is, is um, one of the uh, highest uh, chelating compounds. But there's all types of amino acid, uh, acids. You know, there's, there's so many of them, dude, that, and they all have different functions, and they all can be catabolized and turned into so many different things. That's what's, that's what's amazing about um, about these things and uh, so what's really interesting is this this particular um, paper on amino acids isn't geared toward anything in particular it's just talking about the pathways in plants and it gives you like the molecular breakdowns that are happening in these plants and it says hey what does this turn into this what does this turn into this and if you look at some of the comp the chemical compounds that these are turning into i know from doing other research that these are all the the starting uh the starting points for 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 like uh, different cannabinoids different terpenes you know so you get to a certain place are not just for those in, in particular, but different flavonoids, just different things that can increase, you know, the the quality and the functionality as a whole. If that makes sense. What what was the spark that caused you to start diving into some of the scientific literature? Like where were you at in your brain journey? You were like, we gotta find some different shit than the homies know. Well, I had to. I didn't have a choice, dude. So look, I've been doing this for a really long time, right? And it's like, so I was like, I was on PFA, Probiotic Farmers Alliance, probably in the really early days. Maybe they had like two or 3,000 people on, on, on that page on Facebook at the time. And I was doing soil, but I was still using like house and garden. And I was, this was at a time where prices in California were just dropping. And I was like, dude, I have to, like, I'm not going to go get a fucking job like working for somebody else. I'm not going to go pump concrete. I'm not going to go hang drywall. Like no. fuck that. So my option was I needed to figure out exactly how, what I needed to do to lower my costs. And my biggest cost at that time was my electricity and my inputs. Yeah. And so I switched out my lights. I went from HPS to 315 CMH metal, uh, ceramic metal halides. And I started researching, you know, what I needed to do. I started looking at all these different ingredient labels, right? And saying, well, what is this derived from this? Well, what's langbanite? Well, langbanite only costs, you know, $15 for a 50 pound bag. And I'm paying fucking, you know, $85 for a liter of it, you know, whatever it might be. So it was just like, this is getting out of hand. And so I just, delve in and i just started reading every fucking ingredient that was on the shelf at the hydro store and figuring out what was what was in it 
Um, and then I still wasn't fully organic at that point, but I was decreasing my cost. And then my, uh, uh, my partner, uh, my mentor who got me into growing, he's, oh, 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 he's an OG. He's been growing indoor since 92. He was like, I'm going full organic kid. I'm going for it. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do it too. And I fucking switched out my whole system. And I was like, yeah, bro. Like, like a couple weeks later, I told him, or like a month later, I'm like, yeah, switch out the whole system, blah, blah. He's like, oh, you did? And I was like, I was just fucking with you, dude. <laughs> yeah. I was like, um, I was just, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. So my first crop, it wasn't that good. The quality was good, but I didn't hit numbers or anything like that and um then i got turned on you know i was like well i could look at that old sub cool recipe that used to be back on the forums and i looked that back up um and i built that and i was like it's good it, it worked real real well for like a single run but then everything just seemed to shut down and i couldn't figure out what it was and then i did the, and then i started doing all vegan mix doing vegan soil mix like super soil mix and it worked far superior and then i started playing with soil mixes you know, I got to a point where I was doing the inoculations with the EM1 and doing Bokashi and using different bacterial inoculations and doing research. And I eventually got to a place, you know, I started my own Bokashi company. Um, I just, you know, I just delve into it because I needed to have the information to be able to produce the highest possible quality I could. And what really changed for me was... Um, the the results of the cannabinoid and terpene tests when i switched nice. because i was testing independently um at farm labs in san diego uh before and after the switch from uh fertigation salts to organics and it was a night and day difference i mean everything jumped yeah everything jumped and it was like oh, okay well you know um I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep figuring out. It wasn't perfect. And I had real good yields and I had some that weren't so good. And um, I found a system that works really, really well. And it really comes down to the fact that you can keep everything really consistent with the methodologies that I'm using. You can build an SOP based off of a certain variety that you're going to grow. If you know you're going to be growing something consistently, you can build an SOP based off of all of those numbers. Mm -hmm. And then once you know that you have a consistent high quality product uh, where you're maxing out your numbers too, like as far as like my lights that I run, we're running 200, uh, we're running uh, uh, 480 watt LED boards, uh, the 550s from Horticulture Lighting Group. And yeah. as far as the, the, the numbers, are shown as far as U moles and everything we're, we're pretty much maxed out. I don't know if we can really get any higher yield capacity out of there. You know, our, so our numbers are on point. We can get a little bit higher, but it's all going to be just cultivar specific at this point. Like some things are going to produce higher, even when they're maxed out, when we have all the data for the tissue testing. Yeah. Um, but then it's going to come down to, again, some of these biologicals do some really amazing things and it's just being able to dial it in the effective microorganisms, uh, also known as EM one, which I, uh, I sell this. It's the same consortium as micro plus from my company. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like it, the way that it works, it's really amazing because it has so many, different parts to it right um, it's nine different uh species and not only that but it actually does increase other uh organisms it's probiotic so it increases other things like the uh axiomycetes i think that's how you pronounce it i'm super bad with that one uh, the words are hard man you're doing great you're doing great. The words are hard man <laughs> the, the, and, and here's the thing i'm not you know i I didn't go to college either. So I try to explain this in, uh, in ways that we can understand as, as growers, you know, because there's a lot of people who like cannabis is growing bigger and bigger um, throughout other States are opening up. And there's a lot of people like myself who are still in the black market that could potentially have opportunities, even if it means moving out of California or moving to different areas and being able to have the, the type of data uh, and the kind of platform that Peter provides where they can get, get this data, um, 
yeah. is really going to be beneficial because I want to see more legacy farmers. I want to see more OGs, you know, getting, you know, into the, the money side, right? Because that's the only way to change it. If you want to change that big money, you have to put badass people like, you know, in those gardens, you know, who knows what up, who can say, who can say to these people, Hey, this is what, what needs to be done. You can do, you can do craft at scale, you know, it's not difficult. You just have to have like the knowledge, you know? So I appreciate just well, being able to do this and share. So. That's, that's well said too. Cause what I've noticed and you know, the reason why I first started getting into researching some of the stuff is a lot of the legacy growers got good at experiential science. So, you know, making a change to the cultivation space, observing the outcome and making adjustments. And so without the access to labs, without the ability to maybe look through scientific literature, they were able to combine things in a way that led to a desirable out output. And, you know, for the traditional markets, that's fine. Um, but, you know, based on my, in my personal experience, once you go up into a certain scale, you have to know why you're doing something. And yeah. we work with a lot of cultivators. Um, in my consulting experience, we've worked with a lot of consultants. And so we've worked underneath consultants to help them with the regulated transition. We've worked with large farms, we've worked with organizations. Um, and at that scale, you have to know really why you're doing what you're doing, at least to a basic level like you have built. So you've gone through the scientific research and you've and you found a why for the direction you're going. Um, you know, you, you'd be shocked at how many farms we work with that get to be very large that are not doing even any measurement of their process, you know, whether they're hydroponic or living soil. You know, we work with a large number of hydroponic farms that never even do a nutrient analysis. And when we come in as living soil experts, we're teaching hydroponic people how to do drip and drain reports. We're teaching them how to balance nutrients. We're teaching how to get the trace minerals in balance with each other with the macro micro elements. And, you know, I think for anybody that's in a traditional market, you know, it's understandable why they've been against some of the more... Um, you know, kind of the science wing, I guess you could say, is because they've been outcasted and black marketed by different lab or blacklisted by different labs, and they've been disrespected. Yeah. They've been they've been treated in a you know really undesirable way, and that's built a resistance. By the but legislators, by the legislators, let's let's make that like clear though too, because a lot of the times I know that here in Oklahoma, a home grower can't go to a lab and test. I can go to a lab and test with a with a license from the facilities that I either that I either am partnered with or that I consult with, you know, but I couldn't do that. I can't go take my homegrown, you know, and that, and it's like being able to being denied access to, um, yeah. to information. It's just wrong. It's wrong. It should, it should never be in the legislation. I don't know. Agreed. Well, and it's the business's decision too. Like as we've moved up in scale and gotten to larger and larger landscapes, you know, we've now had situations where buying we're buying acres worth of cover crop. And so now you go to a different distributor for that and, um, you know, they'll do one or two transactions. And when they find out you're involved with cannabis, they just block you, you know. And so we've personally ran into situations where we're working in legal regulated markets with leg regulated facilities. And we still get access issues with certain agricultural products. Um, some labs won't deal with you or they talk to you like you're an asshole. And if you do that, then I just won't, you know, I won't use you. Um, so, you know, there's, there's protocols that you're going to have to usually abide by. A lot of times you don't want to disclose your, your tissue material because hemp is legal. Mm -hmm. um, cannabis isn't, but there's no differential factor between the two. And if that thing doesn't have any THC present in the tissue, you're golden, right? You don't need to label it as cannabis. You know, you know, just put sour cheese berry. You yeah. know what I mean? They don't know what that is. That's just or SCB. You just label it with whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of stupid stuff like that that you have to go around. But I wanted to touch on something that you said too. If you don't as a facility, a farm, if you don't have focus on what your outcome is, um, then you better get it together, right? Because 
Um, I like for me, I know what me and my partners all want. Like we, we have consistent product. It has to be consistent. The marketing, you have to have marketing. You have to have a budget for marketing. You have to be able to, you have to be able to connect with your consumer, um, as a brand because they're so as cannabis grows, you need to be able to distinguish yourself as a brand. Which means that if you don't have SOPs, if you don't have focus, if you don't have meetings with everybody that you're working with regularly and everybody's not on the same page, if things aren't written down and you don't have a direct plan of action for every process, you're probably going to fail. And that's one of the things that I, I tell people, look, you have to have a plan of action. It's not just about quality testing and consistency it's about having good team members it's about having good lines of communication all these things are super important especially when you're scaling because if you're not communicating properly with the people who are back there in those gardens taking care of them and they don't know what to look for they're going to miss that spider mite those spider mites that are starting to creep up or they're going to miss the you know, powdery mildew that might be coming in, or they're going to miss the fact that they're not watering this room enough or that this certain cultivar has uh, different nutritional needs that need to be addressed. You know, there's all these different factors that could, that these what ifs, what ifs. And if you don't have proper lines of communication, you're going to fail. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're saying that we need to put a stake in the ground somewhere and we need some level of measurement to know if we're off track. And I think that's, you know, yeah, exactly. SOPs, baby. Um, I think that's the biggest lack in the traditional market and people from the traditional market moving into the regulated space is as you move up in scale or as you move into regulation with different testing, you find a lot of holes in your game, you know, and you need to be able to choose a direction, know why you're going there and have some level of quantification to keep you inside the field of play. Um, you know, and, and, Historically, a lot of the traditional growers, like I said, they're great at experiential science, but, you know, without some level of functional understanding of chemistry and, and mineral balance, you don't need to be a chemist, but you need to know, like you found out, what's a target on a saturated paste test. Um, you need to know what those targets are. You need to have some sort of strategy for quantifying your process to know when you're outside of those parameters because and then how, to get, how to get those back like how much yeah. do you want need to be able to get back to those levels and not overdo it because here's the thing when we're talking about these minute quantities of minerals it is really really to overdo it in these systems and throw them off i mean one of the biggest things that i see and one of the things that probably a lot of people might not understand is that the the buildup over time of using bad water that has sodium and uh, and uh, chloride in it just completely decimates systems completely. And there's a reason, right? Sodium has such antagonistic properties with other uh, minerals. It's because it has such a high cation. It's such a strong cation. The only thing I, one of the things that I know that is stronger than that is calcium. And that's why oftentimes uh, an agronomist will uh, recommend that you use something like gypsum, which is just, a, a massive amount of calcium and it's basically so they can break those those bonds on the mm -hmm. sodium to those those surfaces that they're bonded to right well and just even doing a nutrient analysis a lot of the hydroponic growers that we work with when we start doing a nutrient analysis of their process you find astronomical levels of, levels of chloride you find very high levels of sodium and and most often you find a dysfunctional balance of macro elements and micro elements and all that and so getting those things in line um is really important and and knowing knowing what the goal is or at least knowing what where you're at we don't know how to move forward unless we're able to know where we're at yeah and, and and the, what does that mean is that you that because of these because of the way that they function the plant is going to take them up it kind of mm -hmm. doesn't really have a choice so then you create imbalance within the material itself. And that's a lot harder to adjust than, uh, I mean, you can't really adjust imbalance. If you have something that's just way out of disproport, if it's completely out of dis is disproportionate in the, in the tissue, you know, most of the times it's not, it's not going to recover. Right. right. 
Very good. Um, oh, hey, so check this out. Back to the amino acids, catabolism, and plants. There's a really neat graph in here, and it talks about um, it talks about possible energy yield. And this is one of the things that uh, brings me back to the thing about when I talk about potential energy, because a lot of the times the plant is having to release a lot of this energy in the form of exudates, right? So it's using all these, uh, this photosynthetic energy to create compounds that it's going to eventually release into the soil system to balance it, maybe change pH, maybe make something a little more available. So that's one of the things that, that a plant will, will dump uh, sometimes up to 85% of its photosynthetic energy is converted into exudate so it can change its soil environment so that's why balancing out those environments and having proper soil ph proper nutrient cycling capacity uh having things really balanced uh, will help reduce the amount of energy that they put into those uh into that system um and therefore it has more energy for again for more metabolic processes uh, like i always say acquired resistance, just maximizing genetic potential. Here's a really interesting thing. So this, this, um, this science paper has a graph in here and it, and it says possible energy yield from complete oxidation of amino acids. So this has to do with one of the things that I talked to, uh, talked on about in biological crop steering, which was, um, redox and oxidation potential. So when these things are, completely used up they offer an, an actual uh, an amount of energy right and when we talk about energy and soil systems we're talking about available energy that can be used by like microorganisms for example they need a certain ratio of carbon to nitrogen we know that i'm sure you know that from mm -hmm. um on uh, doing soil classes and stuff um so what they're talking about is the NADH, the FADH2, um, and the uh, ATP, that uh, 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 phosphoryl phosphorylation cycles, which are basically the energy uh, currency for plants. It's how basically uh, plants are able to do anything. It's like their fuel. So amino acids, each amino acid offers a potential an energy potential. So when you bring in these amino acids into a plant, you're not only getting that nitrogen, you're getting the, the chemical constituent itself, but then you're also getting the energy potential that's associated with that. Right. And it's all right here, like uh, triocene, NADH 11, FADH 2, 3, direct ATP is 2. Uh, AP, ATP synthase uh, through phosphorylation, the number is 34. So you're getting that many different molecules. And we, and if you understand how these cycles work, they exponentially uh, increase with the availability of, of fuel. Right. It's the energy system in the mitochondria. So the ATP to ATG conver uh, conversion. So the adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, all that goes through the cells in the mitochondria and what comes out is energy. Exactly. And so one of the things that that, uh, that potentially that we'll see um, is that we're going to see increase in like a cytokine in production, which will increase cell, uh, cell, Foundation. you know, the time that cells reproduce. We're going to just see so much uh metabolic increase in, in, in energy energy potential I, I just I I don't know why there's not more talk about the energy potential that goes into these systems and how to utilize these these this energy potential through both redox through both the induction of amino acids and these and what energy is being released with what micro and macronutrients as well because there's there's a, an associated, a uh, number of energy that goes with all of these, all of these, uh, these chemicals, these minerals, these organic acids, and they're all potentially converted into into the different processes that are making these systems function. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, I mean, some of this science is absolutely incredible, but 
if you're just looking at this paper, this is like a piece of a puzzle, right? What does this actually mean? You're going to need all the papers that go with it, the papers on redox and oxidation potential. You're going to need all the other ones that talk about all the individual amino acids and what they do in the plant. There's just, there's just so much. Here's another one, role of amino acids in plant response to stress. You know, this, these types, where they're not focusing specific on specific varieties, can be used and translated to multiple species of plants. Right. Whether it's your cannabis or whether it's your, your gardens out, outside in, in your backyard, you know. And the, the cool thing about these is sometimes you get really big papers, but if you just read the abstract and then you read the conclusion, you can get the gist. Of right. what most of these are talking about. And if you really want to delve into it and find out the processes of what they're doing and different results that, you know, then go through the stuff. But if you just want to kind of brief, like, and you're trying to find just things that might be relatable, you can usually find it in the abstract and the conclusion of these papers. Right. Yeah, I think maybe too, you know, we're doing a live thing, but I think maybe once this gets posted, maybe make a comment on there and put the titles of these. I smile periodically because I'm trying to watch the chat and some of the stuff's pretty funny. <laughs> um, but uh, they're cracking on my hairdo and shit. But, um, yeah, wear a hat. <laughs> yeah, no, we, 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 hat. we've been uh, hermetic, uh, hermetic, <laughs> Hermeshia Lucens has been diligently posting the PDFs on uh, the oh, Discord. Awesome. So oh, okay. I, I created a library uh, channel on the Discord uh, where Hermeshia is. Uh, yeah, and, and this is really interesting, too. It's like it says there's a part in here that talks about the effects of amino acids on membrane permeability and iron and ion transport. So, again, we're talking about the, the ability for these amino acids to permeate the, the membranes of the cells of the roots and the the leaf tissue and be able to help increase the transportation of all these nutrient right. element ions you know so there's just so much that goes with uh, these systems as a whole and you know so i try to f i've been focusing on more than just the biologicals even though that is a huge proponent of it but for me right now if anybody wants to know what i do is i do weekly inoculations of the probiotics which is like I think it's seven or eight different species of bacillus, which includes bacillus subtilis, bacillus fermentarium, bacillus uh, del Bruchi, del bacillus um, fermentarium, and then a couple others. There's the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then there's the right up Pseudomonas blueustrius, which is a... Uh, Interesting bacteria because it has four modes of metabolism and it's also it's photo autotropic. It can photosynthesize. It can borrow electrons from inorganic compounds. It can take uh, electrons from organic compounds and living other living organisms. It's a very interesting yeah. um, consortium of microorganisms. And then it also has the uh, fermented yeast. These really promote a lot of the, uh, soil microbes as well but we're getting those in there as uh, pathogen, pathogen suppression nutrient cycling it works as an amazing phosphorus cycler um, it really helps increase the uh the silica avail availability in the soils hmm. and then i'm also using uh, a very concentrated bacillus subtilis with uh the trichoderma Trichoderma hazarium. I don't yeah. know if that's, that's right. Yeah, you, you um, there's a lot of research on those two as well. And across the board, it's kind of been shown across the board in almost all plant species that the, the benefits that you get from using the different combinations, again, for pathogen suppression, nutrient cycling, cytophore production, uh, biofilms. There's a lot of different things that these things can create. Um, the organic acids, all the metabolites, some of them are target specific antibodies that just kill off things that are similar to them that might be pathogenic to the plant. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also use the Bavaria bassiana mm -hmm. uh, in the soil system as well. These consortiums all work and play really well together. Um, however, 
the Bavaria Bassiana Trichoderma. I really want to do more um, science to see how how compatible they are because they're both different types of fungus. They have different functions. They have different food sources. So I don't see them being uh, having antagonistic relationship with each other because the Bouveria bassiana really actually it, it's parasitic to the insects so it doesn't require the same nutritional uh requirements as the trichoderma so i just don't see it being a, a problem but i'd like to really see if there's any type of relationship that i don't know of mm -hmm. um so that's With what i'm currently using but there's more stuff coming um mm -hmm. i have discovered a couple more research articles on the cannabis microbiome and one thing that made me think of this again was earlier when you were talking about how over a period of time you would, the biology and soils change and it's not just even with the continual inoculation, the biology changes. Uh, the biology changes as the plant matures. Uh, there's a, a temp, it says there is a temporal spatial relation between the cannabis microbiome or I guess the whole, not just the, the, yeah, the entire microbiome, the uh, endosphere, the phylosphere, the rhizosphere. So it's going to be consistently changing as adapting as that plant ages. And I believe that's due to the fact that the plant is creating different chemical constituents throughout its life and its nutritional needs kind of change. And I think that adaptation of the things that it's biosynthesizing and releasing into the soils and within itself, because again, some of these things are endophatic. And so even the endophytes change. And I think it's because the, the availability of what they have access to inside that plant changes, the availability of what the plants giving the soil system changes. Uh, that's kind of my theory, I guess, understanding of how it works. Yeah. Well, it's definitely one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect is all the other things that happen in the cultivation space. And so the work, my, uh, my wife and I work together and we're both qualified to do the microscope analysis. So when we came into the commercial space, um, from my understanding, we did far more analysis than anybody else had done previously. And so, you know, a lot was really learned and we tracked a lot of facilities. And so, you know, there was facilities that we were working at full time that were large scale that we were tracking uh, weekly for many months. And then there's clients that we've worked with that we tracked. What seems to be most, um, most impactful to the soil communities is either water volumes or um, feed volumes. And then uh, mulch layers also. So I'm speaking more like the living soil. You're doing more like a high porosity, um, uh, medium, which is a little bit different, but it still has some of the same considerations. But when we track a facility from start to finish through a harvest cycle, um, most often the, the biggest dictator in what happens biologically is, is really water volumes because a lot of the organisms we're after are aerobic, uh, like the EM1 you use or facultative anaerobes, so they can kind of swing. They're like the, I call them the transition team. They kind of handle that range. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, they're yeah very suited to your your situation and when you start getting a larger salt soil volume you get mulch layers you get cover crop and all those things start to play in um, pretty much every farm we've worked with is using too much water um, from the standpoint of allowing oxygen in the root zone to allow these aerobic organisms to really proliferate so what we see when we track a facility from start to finish if it's a brand new soil mix gets thrown into a pot we inoculate it and we start to track it um, you can take our compost, which has very high levels of all the organisms considered biologically complete. You can inoculate that in a root zone and seven to 10, late, seven to 10 days later, take another sample and see what happened. What's interesting is you can inoculate with a certain population and ratio of organisms, but that's just part of it. It's the root zone water. It's the amount of feed that you're giving that determines what wakes up, what functions, what starts to, um, actually proliferate and that part that whole part i think is one of the most underestimated aspects of organic cultivation um you can read and i don't know if people watching after can see all the comments but there's a lot of people kind of discounting some of the soil food web thing which is which is pretty standard 
Um, but that comes from an extreme lack of understanding and experience with what we're talking about. And so it's hard to understand what's happening if you haven't been quantifying over time. Um, and that's really mostly what we do. So we've seen a lot, um, a lot of times, you know, just making a slight change to watering makes dramatic efforts to increasing aerobic organisms, um, you know, and changing feed rates and then finding the homeostasis between those two factors in a, in a more permanent soil system will definitely have profound effects on, you know, what wakes up because in, in biology, they're all very specialized. Um, they operate under um, certain oxygen concentrations, certain water concentrations. And if it's not their conditions, then they go to go to sleep. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, too. So one of the one of the interesting things is a lot of these soil microbes, they have the ability to create endospores and encapsulate their DNA into, uh, you know, into a space. And they're able to, you know, wait until the environments are right, until they can start to proliferate and start to reproduce and go to job. But if they don't have the right food source or the environmental conditions aren't right, it's just not going to happen. And I always say, and you're, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Hydrology, pH play a huge, huge part because if you're having constant fluxes in these systems, as far as the, um, the moisture content, it's going to, it's going to change the biology consistently. It's, you know, it's, it's just nothing you can do to, to change that. If your soil dries out, yeah, it's going to, you know, I'm sure you've seen hydrophobic soil. You know, it's, it can be really hard to, you know, get that you know, correct, you know, very quickly. Right. In my and that's, you know, when we're teaching, you know, pure living soil, a, a lot of times the hardest thing to communicate to a grower that's had success in other strategies is that the watering is different. And so in a, in a true permanent soil, living soil environment, um, you know, watering to full saturation or watering to full runoff isn't necessarily ideal. Um, and letting a full dryback, which we've all been accustomed to and, and proven as a good strategy in other in other cultivation uh, areas. But when you do that in living soil, every time it goes dry or you let a full dryback happen, the organisms either go to sleep or they die off, depending on how quickly that happened. Um, so so sometimes when you try to make the jump to a, to a full permanent living soil, if you stick with heavy saturations and drybacks, there's going to be problems biologically because all sorts of weird little nuances start to take place. And, you know, part of having a soil that's not hydrophobic is having a soil that's inoculated with organisms and then they maintain. Um, and so the water holding capacity of a soil goes up, um, the better you get at maintaining adequate moisture levels to keep those organisms alive and thriving, which I think that'll is- also improve, That'll also improve with your organic matter content mm -hmm. of your soils <coughs> as well. Um, the, the holding capacity you know for me uh aeration is super super huge and it's one of the reasons why even in most uh in most commercial mixes that are available i still add aeration um mm -hmm. to my mixes and i do that because i want to completely saturate mm -hmm. the soil but i don't want runoff right and you're you're absolutely right you don't want runoff in these types of systems because if you're running something off, it means that you've taken something that is essentially you have what a bed or a pot and you're letting all that stuff run out, mm -hmm. which means that you're losing, you're losing vital minerals and nutrients that way. Um, and you're trying to, the, the whole goal for, for us is to retain everything and balance that soil. So I don't, you know, I, I train and, and tell the employees that I work with, we want complete soil saturation, but we don't want runoff. Right. Now, there are exceptions to the rules, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you got, if you're having some type of issue um, and you find out it's sodium or you have something that's, that's too high, the that's only solution might be to flush. 
But then you're going to have to reamend, and you're going to have to get those levels back up to proper after you've, you know, dealt with the issue. Right. I think it's important to define context a little bit too, with regards to the goal, because, um, you know, the strategy that you've navigated to and found success within commercial scale. I think the way you're watering is the most appropriate. So you've you've added a lot of porosity, you've lightened up that soil, and then so you know it's easy to get oxygen in and out of there. Um, with the people that we work with in a more traditional, like kind of permanent living soil, we actually want to slowly bring that soil up to moisture and then try to maintain that moisture. And so when we track a facility from start to finish in a harvest cycle uh, using the microscope, um, we'll see a delay in establishment in organisms and we'll see kind of like a glass ceiling on their increase. And so that if if you have a cultivator that's fully saturating and fully saturating and then allowing some level of a dryback, from a biological standpoint, you're actually hindering organism establishment because it's too anaerobic for most of the things that we're inoculating with. And so in, in, a, in the context of a more permanent living soil, it seems it, best. See, I think it's different for me, though, because, right, I, I yeah. you know, I do have... Mm, a farm that I am owner of, I'm part owner of, and we're doing 85 foot long beds, two feet deep and four foot wide, you know, and we're using the same type of very, very porous soil mix. Um, but the difference I think is that, you know, for our, for our biological programs, we're not worried so much about promoting um, you know, different, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not focusing on like making sure that it's that, you know, like, okay, let me, let me start over. Okay. Yeah. Let's take, uh, our biscular mycorrhizal fungi like glomus, right? I don't inoculate with that. I don't inoculate my soils with things like, um, the, uh, azobacteria right nitrogen fixing bacteria um i don't knock i don't see a necessity for these things because these types of bacteria are geared for the facilitation of getting the plant something that it needs mm -hmm. um but because i already know that the plant already has everything that it needs as far as because i can see it i can physically see it on out as data um mm -hmm. I really just want to try to promote the types of microorganisms that are going to be best for that type of system. And, and it's, you know, for me, it has been the, the foculative anaerobes because the thing is, I don't have to worry about if I don't have to worry about root pathogens, right? Because those types of conditions that might occur in these types of soils are going to be taken care of by these foculative anaerobes that are already present. You know, and then the and then the uh, the the trichoderma as well, you know, because these things, the types of microbes that I'm using will pretty much destroy a lot of the other ones like outright. Like if you were to put these in a Petri dish with um, other other types of microbes, trichoderma is notorious for just ruining people's. Uh, uh, mushroom cultivation spaces, or it's notorious for ruining well, that's, uh, that's labs. A, it contaminates yeah. everything, right? It's because their their ability to procreate and reproduce they're very very strong. That's what's special about these types of consortiums. I'm trying to use the best ones that are suited for agricultural purposes, and the reason why they're suited is because they're creating these compounds that are beneficial to the plant. And I don't, and then I don't have to worry about if my soil's anaerobic or if there's a too much, a little, uh, you know, if there's too, if it's too wet at the bottom or like, you know, those things become less of a factor and an issue in these types of environments because you, you know, we have these types. And I know that, you know, a lot of the inoculants, they'll work, but again, you have to create uh, homeostasis for that because a lot of like you said before a lot of these biologicals are specific mm -hmm. you know they have specific tasks and they have, they operate at specific pH ranges at specific hydrology levels and all of those have to be conducive for them to be able to procreate and continue doing what they're doing mm -hmm.
It's one of the reasons I just continue to inoculate with the EM and the trike and the and the bacillus and the blueberry because it's just consistent across the board, guaranteed results from what I'm seeing anyway. I'm just getting it. Sure. Yeah, and it's it's clear that you've. Um, I think what's important to define is there's many ways to get towards a goal. Um, and so you, you know, you've, you've found a strategy that works well for you. And with the combination of ingredients you're using, the watering strategy that you're using is working well. Um, I do think it is important though, to define a little bit, um, in the difference of my understanding of things in that, you know, when you go through the Dr. Lane courses, she really breaks down a lot of the concepts of, um, uh, dissolved oxygen in the root zone. And so these facultative anaerobes, um, from my understanding, operate in four to six parts per million. All the very aerobic things happen above six parts per million. Um, and so once you're in that four to six parts per million or below, that is actually the range of dissolved oxygen that the pathogens do exist. And so, you know, you can't, you can have, um, a successful cultivation strategy that's operating within that facultative, can uh, facultative anaerobic zone, but from a biological standpoint, the specialized organisms that are the root born pathogens happen within that range. Um, and so when we get outside of that range by inoculating with a full soul food web, um, you know, meaning not just a few species of bacteria, you know, we're talking about bacteria, their predators, fungi, their predators. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to, um, uh, there's a lot more benefit that I think could be had, um, you know, and I think with your specific, with your specific situation, uh, there's a little technique that we do called a protozoan soup or protozoan infusion. And essentially what you do is you use straw. a given material. Yeah. Well, a straw is one of them, right? So straws, grasses, um, uh, I have like a alfalfa hay product that I use that's really consistent. Um, and essentially what you do is you aerate that product and it, it provides oxygen. So the bacteria wake up, the bacteria start to grow. And then at a certain point, their predators wake up and start to grow. But if you get good with a microscope, you can time these things into a desirable population. And so you can actually manually increase the populations of the predator of bacteria. And then um, you can, you can make them shelf stable in a way or you can use them. But if you were to add a protozoan infusion or, or a protozoan soup or whatever you want to call it, if you added that to your inoculum at like one to 3% dilution rate, I think you would be really blown away by the results. Um, especially during a time, like when you're trying to stack nodes or something. So a lot of times um, people will use different nutrient strategies to stack the nodes during the first um, few weeks of flower. If you introduce some sort of predator prey interaction, there's not many things I've seen that match that growth response. Uh, you can also cause a problem. So if you introduce too many protozoa uh, or the predators of bacteria, you can actually collapse the soil food web system, which is a really interesting concept. Um, it's like throwing too many sharks in the tuna tank and all the sharks eat all the bacteria. Um, but in the, in the sense of soil food web, you know, the, the, like you said earlier, the bacteria are the basis of that entire system. So if you over, overgraze them or over um, collapse them using this type of strategy, you actually collapse the entire soul food web, which is really fascinating. Um, but I can I can work one of those up and send it to you. I think you I think you'd be really uh, with with the context of the strategies you're taking. It, it would be really easy to execute and incorporate um, yeah. and put in there. And especially too, if you use like uh, bacterial feeding nematodes. So I'm not sure if you're using, um, most people end up with the SC or the SF nematodes, uh, which yeah. are good and they do, from what I understand, they, they do do a little bit of bacterial feeding, but like, holy moly, you cannot match what you can do by just adding some HB nematodes. That shit's crazy. Legitimately, some of the first um, large scale living soil facilities that hired us, it was simply because you know, they had been using this type of nematode based on their um, advisor, whatever, whoever they were working with, and they couldn't figure out why some zones were were uh, yielding significantly more than the other. What we found was that there was um, very uneven distribution of those nematodes across the space. So just having larger concentrations of them in different um, plant groups 
you'll, you'll see a considerable growth rate. Um, but, uh, but yeah. It'd be interesting to see, um, you know, I, I, I'm having re like, I'm having really good success overall. Um, nice. I haven't had a whole lot of, uh, issues as far as, you know, um, the, I mean, the biggest issue that I have is just the lag time on testing, you know? It's like, even if I send send it priority, it still takes time. I, I would love to have real-time data, <clears throat> um, maybe in the future. Uh, but it, it's, it'd be interesting to see. Um, I, to be completely honest, you know, I... I don't know if it would be, if it happened. I keep thinking that, you know, if, when you talk about, I don't, I don't know. When you talk about, uh, what is it? You said there was too many protozoa and they fed on all the bacteria. <clears throat> yeah. So, I'm sorry. What was the last part you said? What? I, I was, it made me kind of think of, um, you know, just, I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, redox potential, oxidant, oxidation redox potential. If those things being consumed also has an effect on that as well. well I just, I haven't seen any paper. I haven't seen any, any uh, papers. I'd love to read anything that, you know, correlates to um, modified systems or just like the functionality of, you know, what, what the benefit to the plant is. Because that's my my main focus is you know is the soil system balance you know and then just getting the 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 known benefits from the bacteria you know because there's tons of science on the stuff that that I'm using and and that's kind of like and I've seen it work really well so that I want to be able to see if you have some I'd love to see if they have uh, if it's making just minerals more available if it's increasing the nutrient cycling capacity or how those um how those actually function i'd love to be able to see how how it's functioning in the soil as well. um yeah um what would why what would make it you know create you know let's say you know tighter node nodal spacing that's really yeah. interesting to me because you know, ha when we talk about, you know, uh, a bacteria's ability to have a physiological effect on a plant, it usually comes down to a couple of things that I've seen, which is the metabolites that that bacteria is producing, which usually causes something else to happen, like, um, you know, so something is chelated or, you know, it's an organic compound if you use. And then the, also, which is another interesting one, which is the ability for them to create what are called indoles, which change codons uh, on genes, which are like the stop and start points, stop, stop and start read points. And so a lot of these could just be random gene mutations, but I, suspect that because nature's found a way to do this that um there are also you know plenty of indoles that or bacterial endophytes fungal endophytes that can create indoles mm -hmm. to create uh, to trigger those you know different gene responses so that they either have more of a you know, synergistic effect with the plant, or maybe it could even be something that's, that's, you know, pathogenic. But I think that that's one of the things that I see with the bacteria. So my, my main focus really is I wanted to, I want to see, you know, what the, what the mode of action, I guess, what the pathway is to see the physiological side effect. Totally. So, um, you know, I, I come from a hydroponics background. Um, I had some really solid hydroponic mentors that went on to do some pretty big things in cannabis. Um, and and not only they were good, they, they had very high standards. So if I came to them and said, hey, I heard this on the internet, they would literally interrupt with, they would literally, literally interrupt you and say, 
you know, have you done this yourself? <laughs> and be like, well, no, I just read it. And they'd be like, don't say another word until you go do it yourself. And so I came up under this environment of, you know, high standards of the things that you said and bringing to the table things that you've experienced while also making a good discussion, but, you know, staying way away from things that weren't real. Um, and those people were really good at stacking nodes. They were really good at getting the yield. Uh, what they weren't good at was managing powdery mildew, which was my main motivation for getting into Soil Food Web because I could see, you know, what I, back back what I call like the Prop 215 comfort air in California where you could stack 99s and go pretty crazy without fear of getting in trouble. You know, I was under the impression it was going to be legal in six weeks, you know? <laughs> and so I started looking at how do you get away from using systemic fungicides? Um, one of the things that I did was I looked back at what those friends were doing as far as like foliar feeding strategies they would use during the, uh, excuse me, during the first weeks in veg to stack nodes. And so I kept trying to look for ways in biology to do that same thing. What I found is what creates that the most is these predator to prey interactions. And so essentially what you have is in bacteria, you have um, the potential for nutrients but it's it's mostly working on digesting minerals and sticking small pieces of soil particles particles together. When you take a nematode or you take a protozoa and you introduce it in there, you now have a faster release of nutrients. Um, how that works is is um, in a simple in a simple concept, you have like the carbon to nitrogen ratio of um, the different organisms and the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the various organisms are different. And so as the protozoa consumes a bacteria, it takes in some of those carbon and nitrogens, but it needs to match its carbon to nitrogen ratio. So there's gonna be an extra of carbon or there's gonna be an extra of nitrogen. Just like when we were dividing in elementary school and getting remainders, it's kind of the same concept. Um, it does mention it in the paper, I didn't highlight it, um, but um, it, it talks about how these things happen. So, you know, if one organism is a 10 to 2 and another organism is a 5 to 2, well, then that 10 to 2 animal is going to eat that 5 to 2, and then it's going to eat a second one to get its 10, and then it's going to have two extras because it only needs two of the nitrogen portion. So if it's 10 carbons and two nitrogens, and it's eating something that's five carbons and two nitrogens, it gets its two nitrogens from one bacteria, but when it eats the second one, it now matches the carbon, but it releases two nitrogens, I guess. Um, and so, yeah. And then and, stint, it makes sense too. Exactly. So what one of the paragraphs that I was reading in the um, presentation in the beginning was, how much more nitrogen was being released in a given or organism assemblage or assembly of um, organisms. And by far the, well, I mean, my, my own personal journey was starting out with non-biologically complete materials, meaning a compost that had mostly bacteria, you know, maybe zero fungi, definitely no nematodes, but it had mostly bacteria. If I did the protozoan infusion and added it to that at an appropriate ratio, and you could maintain bacteria and protozoa at ideal ratios, you accelerated growth significantly. And this is where you start to really compete with, match, and even sometimes exceed the growth rates of hydroponics is getting these predator to prey interactions in line. Um, back in my early days of doing this before we had compost that had the full spectrum of soil food web organisms, in desirable populations and ratios like we want. I had to do these all, these type of uh, um, strategies. The obstacle is at scale. For a lot of years, it was remarkably impractical for me to try and teach somebody how to do a protozoan infusion. And in a lot of ways, it was actually very risky because if you overbrew it, you get disease. If you overbrew it, you get too many protozoa. And then if you water it in at too high of a rate, you'll over consume the bacteria and you'll collapse the entire system like a house of cards. And so you'll get a tremendous growth rate and, and above ground visible plant growth response, but then growth will stall and fall off um, in flower. And so as a strategy- if you, have, if, you have, if you have, you know, um, a healthy soil, 
like I do when I'm testing and I have the problem proper mineral levels. Um, I don't find. Is, so are you saying that this is just for like a system that's just straight biologically driven? You're not adding any minerals into it or anything like that. It's just simply you're just trying to convert what's already there. Yeah, it's any, it's any style in any system. And so so in your in your particular system where you're introducing a lot of bacteria and you have adequate, desirable and consistent dosage of mineral density. So you've achieved your commercial quality and yields through being very accurate with chemistry with the basic support of biology. If you were to add in the HB nematodes or you were to add in an appropriate dilution of the protozoan infusion, you, it's likely you'd get another 10 to 30 percent in most categories. Um, the, the tough part is, you know, until really recently, we didn't have a way of scaling the protozoan infusion technique, which in your in your system where you're doing more of a dry back, you're re, you're regularly inoculating. Um, you would need to regularly inoculate with these things because you might get some die off in the, in the um, I don't let anything dry out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, um, I don't mean dry out. I just mean in in that process of dry back, you move in and out of um, desirable moisture for the organisms to be operating at the highest levels possible, um, which there are, it starts to split and become more and more and more and more and more. But, um, you know, even just putting in some HB nematodes, uh, the tough part would be if you added the nematodes to your res, like you do with the EM1, they would all sink to the bottom. And then if you're dispensing it with a pond pump, you'd pull them out. You can, but what, what we found was more practical was just put the nematodes in a smaller solution. And so the nematodes that we like to get come in on a, come on a sponge. And so you just... Um, from BioBest? Sorry? From BioBest? Uh, they're, they're, they're the first people that I saw offer the sponges, yeah. Um, and it's by far the by far the best strategy. All the powder and all that, the vermiculite's the worst. Um, yeah. The powder is dodgy because if it dries out, they all die. But the sponge is the gel sponge. I think is uh, my preferred method for inoculating with the different nematode varieties, um, mm -hmm. and it's really easy, you know. And they're storable, so uh, mm -hmm. you know they control a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in soil insects, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. mm -hmm. I think they're, they're an extremely HB effective. is a good one also for for root aphid, if I'm not mistaken. The combination of Steiner Nema and HB works really, really well for uh, for general inoculation for IPM, especially at scale. Because, um, well, you know, I didn't have a problem, but I was using kind of a really large pump, like a large volume pump, and it's like a submersible, and it just has it's really just a submersible, and then it has this like PVC that just goes back into the water, so it's constantly moving large volumes in a small space. To, com to continue agitate and when I uh, scoped it on our microscope um, after the even after the runoff through the soil I did a test one time uh, right. you know I watered it in I looked at it after it was running in the in the mix for a little while and then I watered it into the soil and then I took some of the solution just to see what was in there you know nice. and yeah it's a they're really good I mean I've been using nematodes for a long time. I just never thought of them as, uh, I just never thought of them in that context as far as like a bacterial cycle or, you know. Yeah. And what's funny is if you, like I've been saying this for several years on different podcasts and things like that. And, and when growers call the predator insect people and they say, I want the nematode that produces nutrient cycling and they'll always say it doesn't do it, which it's kind of funny to me because even if they're not eating bacteria and cycling nutrients, anything that eats another thing is cycling nutrients. Yep. Um, but uh, even the predator insect people aren't really hip to what I'm talking about. But um, there's some questions in the chat. I'll restate it again. But the nematodes I prefer for the purpose of nutrient cycling, I'm not considering any pest control. I'm literally looking to increase the delivery of nutrients um, is HB, so heterabditis. The most common nematodes are SF or SC, the Steiner Nema Feltier or Steiner Nema Karpaskier or how you say all this stuff. Um, but yeah. the HB 
and and I, I prefer to use sound horticulture. Um, we've used all the brands um, that are available and sound horticulture continues to have accurate, you know, concentrations and they're very alive. Um, yeah. So we've been using them for the last few years, but really if you're looking to distribute them evenly, um, a lot of times when we start to put things into a res biologically, we start to run into wild um, dispersant issues. And so the bacteria will mix quite well. Um, anything else really starts to get kind of wonky, especially the nematodes. But we found the best results at any scale really is um, dissolve, or, uh, dislodging the nematodes into a, sm a very small volume of water. And so a lot of times we'll dissolve it. I have like a little Pyrex dish that's about three inches deep and about that big. And we'll put the um, sponge in there with just three, four ounces of water. And then from there, we'll um, take that kind of weird milky solution and I'll separate it when it's at its smallest volume. Because the more you start to move those nematodes into a larger volume of water, they're so small and their density is heavy there in water. So they go to the bottom they get really dispersed. So I always try to keep them in the smallest volume of water. And then I put them into a little scientific wash bottle, like a little eight ounce. Um, sometimes if you go on Amazon, they sell them as a tattoo wash bottle or an eight ounce scientific wash bottle. For most scales, the eight, inch, eight, eight ounce bottle is good. When we get into larger properties, we move up to like a 16 or 24 ounce bottle. But anytime you increase the water volume with nematodes, you're penalized with variations in dispersion. Um, so that that's my preferred method. You just go around and you know do a little bit of that. So yeah. um, I actually have to get going here, uh, but it was as always really great to to be on the show. It was good talking to you, Scott. Thanks, uh, Peter, for bringing this wonderful platform to the community. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody's interested in um, what I'm doing, you can find me at Rust Brandon, all one word, R U S T B R A N D O N on Instagram. Oh my God, it's almost like we had it queued up. <laughs> it <Nice. is. laughs> so, um, yeah, I appreciate you letting me come on here. And, and, we'll and, and by the way, uh, can we can we get a vote in the chat? Would you like to see the uh, the uh, Scott and Brandon show? <laughs> <laughs> Weekly, you, you guys are the two curmudgeons, <laughs> <laughs> the two soil curmudgeons. But uh, anyway, that was my that, that's what I was thinking about as you guys were talking. That if we had a weekly uh conversation, um, and... it might be interesting. I'm getting all of my podcasting stuff in my office here set up so. Hopefully I can bring a little bit more professional quality content, I guess, to like the YouTube channel and IG and all that stuff. Nice. Um, but it is getting late. I have another appointment. All right. So thanks again, guys. I'll talk to you guys soon. All yeah. right. See you, Brandon. All right. So Scott, you got a whole bunch of questions from the chat. So let's uh, Jonathan Moore. I've seen your same question five times and I've been patiently waiting to ask it. Uh, can we address the use of trichoderm and container soilless substrates, Dr. Uh, so when Dr. Lane is talking about the difference between trichoderm and mycorrhizae, um, it, you know, it's coming from four decades of analyzing soil organisms in, you know, all types of systems. From what I understand, if you try, if you, if you, put organisms in a hierarchy of benefit they provide to plants, um, the mycorrhizae would be slightly above the trichoderma as far as functions that they can perform. Uh, the trichoderma are most uh, well known for dealing with powdery mildew issues, um, if you have an issue. And so the reason why Dr. Lane says trichoderma in select issues is because if you're doing any reasonable reasonable application of what Dr. Lane is saying, you have no mold issues. And most people find that offensive when I say that and they think I'm lying, but that's that's the literal truth. We um I'm trying to think in, you know, the hundreds of farms we've worked with, you know, most farms get rid of powdery mildew in the first harvest cycle that we work with them and they actually work to improve the ratios and quantity of various organisms in the soil and 
you know, very few farms have had any powdery mildew linger on into the second harvest that we worked them. So that's why Dr. Lane says in certain situations, trichoderma, what she's saying is in the event a powdery mildew breaks out, use the trichoderma and then re-inoculate with quality compost to correct the undesirable ratios in the soil that are leading to powdery mildew. Okay. And here's a question from the, uh, or actually, well, just hold on, R read that because you're talking trichoderma. So that, that sounds interesting, but I, I don't know, I, I can't confirm or deny anything, you know, r really d DNA related. Um, you know, for, for like the really specifics of the science, um, you know, my wife is a little bit better. Nick Tomasini is really good at, um, the real specifics of DNA science, you know, and stuff like that. He's doing some research on some DNA. I'm more of like the practical in the ground boots execution in the commercial space. I, I obviously have an understanding of the scientific base, but as far as like things of DNA, I'm not honestly not sure about that. All right. That's a fair answer. All right. So, uh, this is from the discord. So that's another one. Again, I'm not, I'm honestly not sure about that. I got that question in the email earlier in the week. I haven't got a chance to email, uh, answer it. Um, but I, that's, yeah, I don't know. I'm in the, uh, what made flowers grow potent? <laughs> <laughs> what uh, ratio? Yeah. So, all right. So for like the past hour and a half, I've been copy pasting, uh, questions. So I would like to uh, talk. There's been a lot Go. of tea brewing on there. I know like you got some tea. Out there. tea did you say tea brewing? Yeah, there's a lot of kind of comments in the tea brewing that I think need to be clarified. Yeah. So Mighty Microbes asks Scott, you should touch on people brewing teas without a microscope. Very dangerous. If you ain't scoping, you're just hoping. Yeah. And when you say that, people that don't have a microscope, they immediately shut their ears and turn off and say you're being disrespectful. But what the what the cannabis community or really organic gardening in general doesn't understand is that literally nobody is is brewing tea to the spef specifications that dr lane has outlined in her research work to be productive against pathogens um, we've worked with every type of tea brewer available on the market some of those machines you can make tea that hits dr lane's parameters one time um, but disease persists in the in the tubings and on the whatever shenanigans they got in the tank um, that persist and are very very much quantifiable in brew two three four five six um, in my journey as a soil food web analyst we've talked directly to these um, tea brewery manufacturers we've told them what we found in not one situation um, have they been open to our insight as to what we're seeing with their machines in the field for a lot of years, I never mentioned this for fear of getting sued, but I mean, we're going on six years of seeing the same shit and the, the community really just needs to evolve in their um, requirement of accountability from people that make tea brewing equipment. Um, and we need to up our education on what we're even doing. So as far as like my personal strategy, we have abandoned all commercial products that would be a tea brewer. None of them are appropriate in my perspective, in my analysis. Um, we use a piece of equipment from the beer brewing industry because beer brewing has the same requirements that we do. They need consistent, repeatable um, results that are not contaminated by undesirable things. So their equipment works very well for us. So we use something called a non-jacketed conical fermenter and it's all stainless steel. There's absolutely nothing inside the tank. Um, we use one that's cone bottom. So we aerate from the bottom, which is very important. Um, and then it uses uh, clover clamp, tri-clamp fitting so that everything can be removed and sanitized. Um, in my personal opinion, that's about the only type of equipment that you should consider using if you're in the regulated space. So that's the first kind of soapbox part there too. But there's a lot of comments in, in the comment section talking about trying tea and not having any results. And one said they tried tea and had worse results. Well, that's exactly confirming what I'm saying. Like, most people are, are brewing extremely anaerobic teas that are very detrimental on a plant health. Where people see benefit is if you put organisms into a tank and you put a food source that behaves as a um, digester, so to speak, 
And you can take organic inputs and make them more bioavailable. So the benefit most people get from tea brewing processes is because they use organisms to break down and make those nutrients more plant available. So you get a plant growth response, but in that tea brewing process, I guarantee you, you brewed some levels of disease that start to surface. Um, and you know, when you compare like recipes that I've personally found successful and other recipes for tea brewing on the internet um, that most people follow, um, the amount of food inputs that they put in are literally 100 times what I put in to get results that fit with the research that's defined by Dr. Lane Ingham to have a positive effect on plant pathogens. Um, that research does exist. It's just kind of hard to access. Um, I think the compost tea brewing manual one has it. Uh, Dr. Lane made a second tea brewing manual in like 2015 or something. Uh, Sarah and I were given a paper copy, um, but that book was never put into print. Um, and I believe if you dig deep enough, there are some um, research papers of hers that show, um, you know, what what populations of organisms in a finished tea and what leaf surface coverage is needed to block pathogens. Every single time we follow those characteristics and those biological population targets without exceeding in an undesirable way, it always, always has a very profound effect on um, any sort of leaf pathogen. What we found in our commercial work is scaling tea brewing is almost impossible. And so we've had to come up with other strategies. And that's why you're now seeing the switch from tea to extract. Um, tea is incredibly inappropriate in the commercial regulated cannabis space. Yeah, there you go. Compost tea brewing manual. I believe inside there, in there, um, uh, she gives the targets for bacterial populations, fungal populations. And it's believe it, it's not very much. It's remarkably low of what is needed. It's, but what's really needed is not having an abundance of the omycetes, which are the water molds. that are absolutely very directly correlated to powdery mildew issues in my personal experience. And so you, ha you have a community at wide that is putting literally 100 times the food resources to end up with a healthy compost tea. They're brewing it too long. They're using a machine that brings disease from harvest to harvest to harvest. And this is why it makes it easy for people to discount the techniques because you're not doing what Dr. Lane is saying. When you do what she says in regards to tea brewing and targets, I've not seen something that's more effective. Really. And just quickly, this is the, uh, well, <laughs> that's not what I was looking at. The, the, all right, hold on. You're blowing it. Give me, there we go. Wait, all right, hold on. Back to, no. So weird. Um, anyway, it, it, it was the stout tank. It was the conical. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got a video on the last video. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah. and then someone asked um, about foliar sprays of microbes. Are you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, for the context of our commercial work, which requires scale and giving instructions to people while we're not there, um, it gets very difficult. So the position that that's put me into is um, we have a powder bacterial inoculant that contains the standard 10 to 12 species that are in every product. And it has 10 to 12 species that aren't in, in any other product. Um, so that's the easy, like, dissolve in water, spray on by any um, employee that works really well. Um, what we find in our, in, our, in, our, in our analysis of properties is you don't even really need to spray the above ground biomass with organisms. You just need to have a very healthy root zone from the standpoint of um, desirable and undesirable organisms. So what we find is that we don't even have to cover the leaf surfaces to have them protected. We need to have a root zone that has extremely low omycetes when compared to the beneficial fungi or what we would put into the beneficial fungi classification. Um, and when you do that, it works very well. So, so we do, like, you know, we do have other situations where um, 
we do we do have an ability to put compost tea into a shelf stable bag um, and we have a couple clients that use that on intake of clones that that's extremely well it's separating your facility from powdery mildew that works very well um, but it's cost effect it's 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 costly we're shipping gallons of tea around it's, you know so there's some there's some regenerative obstacles there a lot of plastic but it works very well so th this is a personal question if, if i mean for me uh if in your yard you had hypothetically a four by eight raised bed <laughs> and you were to build it up and and like what what's your soil mix like what what would you when scott scams puts on his uh home gardener pants and, um, and, ta and well, takes off his large-scale facility consultant pants you know it's crazy it's always the same answer that's the beauty simplicity works at all scales um, as far as soil mixes, well, the first thing is not being remarkably dysfunctional from a chemistry standpoint, which is most of the soils that people use. Um, a lot of people ask me, what's my soil mix? And they have to understand that, you know, to be, to be good at making soil, you need to take the chemistry of your components into consideration. Um, people always want a like per cubic foot, um, per cubic foot amount of amendments which makes it easy for us to follow what people i think are completely missing is that there's a npk value of the compost there's an npk value of the cocoa or peat moss um, the lava rock contributes to some extent or whatever you're using and then it's all the things that you put into it and so when i'm regardless of the scale i always follow the same process i gather my inputs i make a mock mix up in the ratios as close to what I'm expecting in my finished mix. I send that off without putting any amendments to the lab to get a chemistry analysis to see what it is. Um, in the case of a large commercial facility, we actually do the compost first before we even bother with any of the other stuff. We'll send the compost in for a basic Malik 3 test to see what the, the amount of potassium is in that product because a lot of composts that are available to really everyone are so high in potassium because they've been rushed through the process or their raw inputs were out of whack that even if you blend that into a one third, one third, one third soil mix, you'll never get to the target. You can't add enough calcium and magnesium to overcome the quantity of potassium. So when I'm making a soil mix, the first strategy is identify which compost you have available to you will even allow you to get to the goal. Once we've determined that, then we make a mock mix. Um, my personal favorite, or well, my least favorite, is a peat moss um, one third, one third, one third. I, I, I'm not convinced cannabis really likes that, even though we use it. Um, it's very hydrophobic. Um, I think there's a lot of problems with it. It holds too much water too long, which actually slows down plant growth. So I've gone a wide range of going from the peat moss one third, one third one third to the other end of the spectrum where we did cocoa. Uh, the growth rates in the cocoa went up considerably from the full peat moss, but then we found that they were very unforgiving, like in a traditional cocoa strategy. So if you're growing in pure cocoa and perlite or something in a pot and you let that pot dry out too much, it'll torch the roots and you'll get that, you know, really unhappy plant look. In a living soil, you still kind of have that same effects with the full cocoa mix. So we experiment in our, you know, loosely termed third, third, third mix. In that one third, it's a blend of cocoa and peat. Um, depending on where that soil is going depends on the ratio. As the water retention part? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So the, I guess the third, the third, third, third mentality that most of us have is one third aeration, one third compost, and then one third usually peat moss. Um, I have personal objections to the harvesting of peat moss, so I've been looking for ways to minimize, you know, it can't be perfect, but we need to minimize where we can. I'm not saying shipping carbon around the world is a perfect solution, but I feel like it's definitely less difficult. What, well, so Delano, who uh, Kevin and I uh, did a fundraiser for to kind of jumpstart his soil company, he he's big on palm fronds. Yeah. 
And uh, be, be, I mean, th- I mean, I can look outside in LA and see, you know, <laughs> they're all over the streets, right? It's uh, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Pit Moss sent me a whole bunch of Pit Moss, which is basically like recycled newspaper. So I've been, I dumped a ton of that into a uh, grassroots raised bed. But like, so my my question is like, for me as a home grower, I have a I have a two chamber. Each chamber's 55 gallon bin uh, home composter. All my food scraps go in there. I have a worm bin, just the, um, I, I forget what the the company is, but it's like a- Yeah, the, know, the through or whatever. You, yeah, you, you know, just the home, the home worm bin. So like I have both those and I'm kind of like, what else do I need from outside my half acre yard um like i feel like i feel like i've replaced the peat moss or the cocoa uh, you know with you know the pit moss which we'll see how that goes but um it, well, it's kind of it's kind of like if, if again I, i'm trying to get you to take your profession your pro well, hat off like no, larry still, bird larry no, bird you're teaching kids no. No, no, it's the same answer, kids. The kids need to step their damn games up because I don't, I don't care if you're one, running a single light building. Um, you know, if you're running a two by four tent, how much electricity is that going to take over the course of a, you know, twelve week harvest cycle? It's going to be more than the cost of a twenty five dollar soil test to start out with a good soil to have a good result. And a lot of times, the smaller the grower, the less, the less room for error you have. And so what happens is people start blending soil mixes together based on Instagram feeds or internet recipes, and they end up with extremely dysfunctional chemistry in that finished soil simply because of the raw materials they were able to aggregate. And so what I'm saying is, regardless of how much soil you're gonna make, regardless of your inputs, before you add the mineral amendments to whatever that mixture of products is, you should send it off for an 18 or $25 soil test. Um, there's a question right now that just popped up. The $25 test comes from Logan. Um, there's another, another, uh, company called Spectrum Analytical that I've recently learned about. Their test is $18. So you mail it to Ohio. Um, and, 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 and so for that, I would basically be mailing my, uh, the, the stuff I'm pulling out of my thermophilic compost bin to be like, <laughs> yeah. let's make sure this is something I want to be putting in my raised bed to grow the stuff I'm going to eat. Well, and not only that, it's at what ratio. So say if the potassium in that soil or excuse me, if the potassium in that compost is high, then you're not going to be able to use a full 33%. You might have to use 22% because the end result of that chemistry is going to be so high. And so this is what people don't understand. Like we, you know, we've done a lot of analysis for micro growers and literally some of the largest ones around. And one of the farms in particular we worked with followed a standard recipe um, that they had even done at another facility and they moved up into a facility that was three times or uh, uh, four times the size. And they followed the same exact thing that worked at their previous facility just fine, but the compost source was now different. They ended up with soil chemistry that was so dysfunctional, you know, it was going to take like two to three years of amending to bring it back into balance. And so what we had to do was we had to recut that soil to dilute all the nutrients down. We send it in for analysis again, and then we amend to correct what the dilution made. So that's, that's, you know what I mean? Like, I I know you want like the simple answers, but I think the industry needs to move up a half a hair. Um, because so many people are struggling so hard with living soil because they're just doing what's accessible to them, which is putting things together for soil mixes that have worked for other people, but their raw materials came with a remarkably different chemistry. And that can literally lead to years of headaches, especially if you're not testing. If you're not testing, you're never going to figure it out because now you're chasing, you know, you see that. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. I like um, sound horticulture. They're my favorite so far. Okay. I, I, they're they're unmatched in other 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 people, in my opinion. The because I I'm one that looks at them. I I was crazy in the beginning for quantifying the quality of the products we were using. Nobody was doing that, and so we've looked at 
all the manufacturers and nothing compares to what sound horticulture is doing that I've seen. Do do you do you because actually before we uh went live I was looking up gypsum. Do, do you use gypsum? Of course. Yeah. Okay. It's you know, and so like the recipe components are gonna be pretty much the same. It's hard to make a soil without gypsum, without oyster shell, without soft rock phosphate. Like you're gonna to need to make those. You're gonna to need to include, or you should be, in my opinion, you should be including as diverse a blend of products for each aspect you know so you, you don't want to use just oyster shell you should use a mix of oyster shell and gypsum you know you want to use a mix of nitrogens so it's going to be really hard to get away from the standard soil inputs it's we really do need to re-examine how we're approaching that process as a community and we need to re-examine how we get to the goal if we want everybody to have success straight away well, and, and that actually that that actually gets me to the um, you know my assumption is the the pit moss is just almost all carbon. So what what would be good nitrogen sources? Well, um, again, for for the home grow kind of like four by four bed. Totally. Um, this is the most difficult part of living soil cultivation, whether you're in, well, especially in the regulated space. Um, you know, if you're trying to increase just nitrogen, it's probably a feather meal. Problem with feather meal is it's high in arsenic, so you can cause a problem. Um, or, or like uh, Brandon said, you know, the amino nitrogen, we use that a lot. You wanna really try and balance out fast dissolving and slow dissolving. So feather meal would be my longer dissolving nitrogen soybean amino nitrogen would be my faster nitrogen. So I'm I'm always trying to do diversity. I have large chunks of calcium. I find powdered sources of calcium. I have large chunks of clay. I have fine powdered clay. I have fast dissolving nitrogen. I have slow dissolving nitrogen. All based on what that preliminary test said. So when I mix together my peat moss, cocoa core, compost, and aeration in the appropriate ratios, from that, I take a sample that's homogenized and I send it into the lab and I have them analysis, analyze the NPK and you know everything. From there is what I determine what needs to be put in or how much of what. You know, the soft rock phosphate is usually pretty standard, you know, but the calcium is going to change respective to the potassium in the compost that contributes to the resulting soil. You know, then how much calcium needs be added to that to bring it up to the appropriate ratios above potassium if that makes sense so if you're a so two by four a while, a while yes. ago uh, you know. wait sorry say that oh just saying like I, I you know I don't mean to sound too out of reach but that's if you're in a two by four grow that's what you should be doing in my opinion yeah. so a while ago uh, John J. Scott asked your opinion on microbial additives like recharge. I don't know. Let's type in recharge microbial recharge micro. You know, the first question is, can you find out what's in it? You know, uh, mm, aha, here we go. He's got one. So it's got amino acid, fulvic acid, hemic acid, molasses, kelp, two types of trichoderma, four bacillus, and four glomulus. Um, yeah, sounds cool if that's really what's in there. Um, my, my objection really to any, uh, I mean, it's I don't know anything about the product. It sounds like it was a little bit more well thought out than other ones in that they put some food in there, so that's cool. Um, when it comes to any sort of inoculant product, you know, since I come from the school of the lane where they qualify you to use a microscope, I check it. I don't care what anybody on the internet says. The first thing I do is put it up onto a slide and I look, is there bacteria in there? Is it anywhere near what they're claiming? You know? Um, and then from there, you got to understand, like, you know, I think the, the microbiome project turned out some really interesting things. And we'll just throw out some numbers like they're estimating there's 100,000 species of bacteria. We've been able to identify through DNA maybe like 10 to 20% of those. And then, and then as growers, we focus on products that have six individual species. And so to me, 
if I'm making very quality compost or have access to very quality compost, I've got those 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 species. Having said that, you know, it still is good to inoculate with certain products to make sure you have them in there. But community wide, we really need to expand our our mindset as to what what the goal actually is, you know. And so to me, if you get a bacterial product and it's 6, 12, 13, 18, 20 species, that's fine. But if there's nothing eating them, you're still waiting for nutrients to become tied up in a body and then released. And if there's nothing eating it, the bacteria, you're, you're waiting for those nutrients to become available through, um, you know, old age, essentially. And so it's, it's being focused on an individual inoculant product is looking at like one to 5% of the actual capabilities and possibilities if you're doing a full soil food web. So to me, it's like, like what's the goal? Is right. the goal to sprinkle in a little bit of bacteria or one species or two species? Or are we trying to have the four system in there? I want the four system. Right. So uh, Steve asked ratio of NPK in a finished blend? Well, um, this is where I also have to say I'm more of a biologically qualified guy than the mineral expert. But I will say that if you're just starting out and you aim for the basic Albrecht amounts, you know, you're aiming for something like 68% calcium, 12% magnesium, and like 4 to 7% potassium, like that will be better than what most people are doing. Um, you know, we're starting to expand out of that. You're starting to see other consultants recommend other ratios, um, you know, a little bit higher calcium, a little bit lower magnesium and higher potassium. Those are then better, you know, than aiming for the Albrecht standards. But in my experience, the soils that people are using are so remarkably dysfunctional from a chemistry standpoint. You just have to get into the lane of, you know, some, some amount of ideal balance, right? So, and then as far as like ratios in between that, you know, like you should have 50 to 100 parts per million of nitrogen. You know, sulfur should be close to phosphate. It should be close to potassium. And, you know, you should have far more calcium than potassium. So yeah. Smiley's Garden asked... Uh... Can you read that? Yeah, I don't. Again, I'm not the um, I'm not that guy. I can tell okay. you what I can tell you what populations of bacteria lead to a good outcome as far as what they are. I'm not that guy. So. That is. That we is go through the slides and keep Q and A. you want to do the slides? I think we could work through some of them. I think it would help. Yeah, yeah. No, go for it. Uh, you got the screen. You you're a master of the screen share, right? And while you're what. I'm going to let you do that and I'm going to do my pee break and then I'll, I'll be less, uh, antsy. Yeah. Well, maybe you should talk while I do my pee break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You, you what, you want to do yours first? Yeah. Get some questions. Honestly, I think I'll be, uh, All yeah, right. give me two seconds. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, you get to watch me, uh, All right, so let's look through some of the questions. And uh, by the way, today is Wednesday. Tomorrow we have a uh, a um, Duke Diamond fundraiser at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, tomorrow night, possibly a hash conversation, although I could use a break, but... Uh, yeah i think i had to go to the bathroom more than scott did so <laughs> anyway i uh i'm just gonna throw up some comments that's right free duke let's see what else ah look at that we have more fire relief. And Adam, I have your question. Uh... <laughs> All right, so now it's my turn. 
Yeah. Uh, so queue up your slides. Yep. And then I'm going to run. Yeah. Yeah. But Adam a while ago asked, can you inoculate your worm bins and have a supply of HP nematodes for months or even years to come without purchasing again and again? Absolutely. That would be advanced level soul food webbing where you um, learn how to perpet perpetuate and propagate like we do with cloning or other techniques. Absolutely. And, and just my question is like, you know, people always talk about EM1. Is that something that like only this one company in Japan has these special sauce to and like you got to get it through them or can people create their own version of it? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's some, I, I believe there is some sort of patenting that goes on, but I think what's important to understand is that EM1 is a, is a primary species. They're an early adopter in a new system. That's why it's so effective because you're putting in one of the primary species, as we'd say, into the system. I think, um, you know, I, I think EM1, I call it the gateway drug to living soils. Um, it gets people into it, but there's just so much more untapped resources above those types of products. You know, they clearly provide a benefit, but, um, you know. But, but, but like, is that like a designer microbe or something, or is that a microbe that you could whip up and keep perpetuating? You told you totally can. That's one of the points. The problem is though, as you start to propagate things, do you have contamination and variation? And, and so you'd want to monitor it, you know, and we have support, we have support for the idea of the, uh, we'll see. <laughs> let, let, let me, let me cue it up. Oh, there it is. <laughs> That's my, this is the, the Scott and Brandon it is. show. <laughs> I, I like Brandon. I, I never heard of him until that episode, but he said some things that I say. I know. I, I love Brandon. And, and I love, I mean, I, I know you and I know kind of the, the shit you care about and what frustrates you. And, and I feel like he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's your ilk. Yeah. No, I like him. Yeah. I don't know what ilk means, but I like Brandon. He, he, but, uh, he, he, you guys are like in the same family of, uh, yeah, yeah. We've both found commercial strategies that are a, a, a type of people or things similar to those already referred to. So well, you guys are of the same ilk. There you go. We're ilks. We're, we're in two very different lanes. But um, yeah, you can tell by the things he's saying. Why not? I like you guys come at things from a different, you know, it's like you, you almost came to similar conclusions from like totally different places and like you met up. Which at I the think result. Is kinda, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the results are similar. You know, he, he, he's growing at scale. Like he has to like those, you know, and I think that's when you pull your hair out. You're like, yeah, that's cool that it worked and like your six plant grow. <laughs> But I'm dealing with commercial farms that like can't fuck up or they go out of business and put 50 people out of work. Um, well, not only that, if, if you're if you're running a four by four or even a four lighter or even an 18 light garage, it's far more uh, easy for you to control problems within that square footage. If you now square, if you now um, if you now scale to be relying on a lot of times minimum wage employees, they're not going to be able to con contain some of the problems that your chosen cultivation practices create and that's i think that's why some people are very unsuccessful at scale and only a few people are very successful at scale because you know you have to be able to contain problems or avoid problems through um you know math or quantifying your nutrient or balancing the chemistry in the soil and then having cultural practices that don't make it worse and you know it sounds like yeah so, but anyway. so, so just quickly while you're while you're queuing up your slides, uh, th this is something I I don't piss in my compost, but I definitely <laughs> piss in my uh, <laughs> in my soil. Uh, good or bad? I mean, depends on how much. I guess you know. Uh, it's ammonia. It's nitrogen. It's minerals. I think um, it would hard for it'd be hard for me to not think about that as I'm putting my hands in it constantly. But I mean, if that's your <laughs> yeah. I'm not asking you to put your hands in my soil after I pissed in it, but well, I, some, 
Yeah, somebody like Swami, I just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but somebody like Swami would, you know, he tells you to put the seed in your mouth and there's a concept of like the intelligence of that plant will bring out um, what you need specifically. So there might be some, I don't know, it might be something like that with the pea on the compost. I just all don't. Right. So with all this pea talk, let me go uh, <laughs> to the bathroom and. Uh, Wait, don't leave. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Whoops. I'm all YouTubed. There we go. Wait, did I do it? Yeah, but just, yep. Uh, oh. so, so, yep, there you go. There we Boom. go. Okay. Oh, we were, we were looking in a mirror of a mirror of a mirror. Got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll be back. Okay. So you just babble. Woo. Okay. So this is, um, this is an adaption of the, um, first, uh, workshops we did in person. Um, you know, I apologize. It took me, you know, four years to get this in more of a digital format, but that's not really my strength. And so when I have the opportunity, I try to get this out there for the people that weren't able to come into our um, in-person workshops. And so here's this. So this is kind of my attempt at explaining the science of living soil systems. Um, I spoke earlier in the podcast about this paper and its effect that it had on me, how difficult it was to find, but kind of the opportunities I saw within the cannabis industry to get tremendous benefit by having predator to prey interactions. Um, we spoke about that at the beginning of the episode. If you are just tuning in, you can go back to the beginning and we go through this entire paper. Um, I've pulled out one graph for this purpose because it's the graph that at the time I was reading it really had the biggest impact on me. And so it's talking about the above ground biomass of the plants across the given time and so um you know soil was sterilized it was put into a petri dish um, grass seeds were grown once the seeds were shown to not be contaminated they transplanted them into the various petri dishes and then they started to add different assemblies of organisms to see their effects on plant growth so on the left side here we have above ground biomass and grams and then down along the bottoms we have the 100 days of the study um, the black line is represented by plant in sterile, sterile soil. The green line is plant with bacteria. Here we have plant, bacteria, and fungi. And we have plant, bacteria, and a bacterial feeding nematode. And then we have plant, bacteria, fungi, and fungal feeding nematode. And so when you overlay the first line of a plant in sterile soil, um, periodically they would chop some of the samples off and weigh the above ground biomass and that's how they got to this point. When you start to add the green line which is plant with bacteria you start to immediately see an increase in above ground biomass simply by adding bacteria because now we're having mineralization of the rock so we're digesting parent material and turning it into plant available forms um, and then we're storing it in the bodies of bacteria for later use. So that results in an above ground biomass change. Here we have the plant bacteria and fungi. And so this one really stood out to me because at this time in my journey, it was very difficult to find fungi. You know, periodically you would see maybe one fungal strand inside of a compost, but pretty much it wasn't even existing in my world at the time when I read this. And I saw there was a considerable increase in plant growth very early on by simply adding fungi. And by adding fungi, we're getting greater soil structure, we're getting more oxygen into the root zone. And if you've done any other cultivation strategy, you know that oxygen in the root zone is one of the most important aspects. I put this green line here somewhere around 30 days because when I initially saw this graph, I thought of the cannabis life cycle. And this is talking about grass, but if we break down the cannabis life cycle to roughly 100 days, from you know a clone striking roots there are some similarities and so when we simply change from plant with bacteria to plant bacteria and fungi you almost get a doubling of the above ground biomass at the 30 day mark and this really stuck out to me because most people will take a clone or a teen and they'll transplant it into a soil and they'll let it veg for two three or four weeks before they start flipping it to flower and I saw if I could someday figure out how to get fungi into my system, I could potentially double the size of my plant going into flower. Or you can back up the calendar and say, okay, if I've currently been growing with plant and bacteria and I'm expecting you know, this slope of 
or I have been experiencing this slope of plant growth, I can, and I'm good with that, I can then add fungi to that system and I'll get a bigger plant that's the same size as what I've been flowering in my old system, uh, you know, 10 days earlier. And in the first farms that we started working with and started really applying the soil food web techniques, that's exactly what we saw. Um, on pretty much every living soil farm that we've ever worked with that was already operating before we got there, um, we've been able to reduce a week off their life cycle somewhere. Um, either in the clone to teen stage or in the teen to prepare for flower stage or sometimes both. When you start to add plant bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode, you get a similar slope and jump up in plant growth as the plant and fungi, but over time you start to get more. And as I referenced earlier in the podcast, um, talking about those actual quantified amounts of nutrients that were produced by adding the bacterial feeding nematode, most importantly, nitrogen and phosphate. And then finally, you start to add plant bacteria, fungi, and fungal feeding nematode. And again, it has a very similar slope and growth rates to the other assemblage of organisms. They change slightly throughout the life cycle, um, but nonetheless, they're still significantly greater than sterile or, you know, with just the bacteria. I put a line here at the 80-day mark, which, you know, in a in a general sense is the you know rooted clone to harvest time period and you can see that you know from plant in a sterile soil at about 140 um, grams and above ground biomass you know in most of the assemblages here we have double that um, this really grabbed my attention and really very legitimately was the reason why I pursued so hard in the work of Dr. Lane when so many people were against it or provided resistance to it and, you know, I can't think of a better way to have spent my life. Um, so finding this paper back then and wanting to chase this goal was really profound for my own life experience. You can see that in the plant and bacteria sample, at the end of the 100 days, all the assemblages are relatively close together. And I didn't understand this when I first read this. And I didn't understand it until, like I said, I got through the courses and did well on my tests and got the opportunity to meet Dr. Lane and work closely with her and eventually got to the point where, you know, we could have a meal and drink a couple beers. And I asked her about this one time. I said, why do these all group together in biomass towards the end? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be more? And she said, well, keep in mind, the study is growing grass in a Petri dish for a hundred days. And, you know, there was a point where root, root uh, bound Petri dish grass came into play. So, um, but I think it's important to mention so that we keep that in mind. If we were to reproduce this in a suitable soil container that's larger, then you would definitely see these start to continue upward and they would finish considerably above the plant bacteria and plant sterile soil assemblages. And why this works is a concept called ecological succession. So Ecological succession is a concept where we talk about the development of an ecosystem from bare rock or parent material or a recently destroyed ecosystem, maybe through a fire or a flood or something like that. But nonetheless, the ecosystem is starting over again. And it goes from bare rock, parent material, moves through to early successional grasses, early successional plants, moves into shrubs and the various types of trees ending up at what we would consider an old growth forest. And so the above ground biomass of a given ecosystem changes dramatically um, in size and potential and complexity as it moves along this scale called ecological succession. I think the part that people are really disconnected from is the concept of ecological succession of the soil organisms that happen below the soil as this development of an ecosystem happens. And so this graphic is supposed to represent the development and ratio of soil organisms as the ecosystem develops. And so these blue dots uh, represent bacteria. And so in the parent early systems, there's bacteria only. We start to get some orange uh, fungi dots as we move across. Somewhere here in the trees, we start to get equal bacteria to fungi. And then in old growth forests, we get actually much less bacteria and far greater fungal dominance. And this is what people talk about when they say fungal dominant ecosystem. Uh, and then the green dots are the protozoa. So also again, in early successional systems, it's just bacteria with the potential 
but nothing really converting those nutrients into plant growth. And then as you get more complex, you start to get nematodes and the microarthropods start to shed the various fungi. Um, when we first started working with Dr. Lane, I asked, where does she think cannabis evolves? And from a basic sense, it's between these two wickets. You know, so in my opinion, I think this is why a lot of people ended in the redwood forests and the Humboldts and what have you, because they were planting directly into an old growth forest. Um, and so they were planting directly into a biological system that was similar to this. And in, in our personal experience, when you move along this line in succession and really just get anywhere near the targeted ecosystem or balance of soil organisms that cannabis is likely to have evolved in, uh, really magical things start to happen. This is a, uh, an image to try and help people that don't have, an, have access to a microscope or can't wrap their mind around how we can use the microscope to make any determination about the soil. And it's actually quite easy. So um, here we're looking at a, um, a microscope sample on 400X that would have come from you know over here. It's very bacterial dominant, very early successional. We know it's early successional because, you know, right here by the red arrow is a piece of mineral that is clear. Um, here we have a piece of mineral that has a brown or tan tint to it. What's happening is the bacteria are habiting, habitating the surface of that mineral, starting the mineralization process. And in that process, fulvic acid and humic acids are produced. So you, I know if I don't know anything about this system or if this, or, I don't know anything else about this soil. And I put up a sample on the slide and I can look in here. I can already start to make assumptions about the development of this ecosystem, saying that it's a primary ecosystem because we don't even have a um, complete inoculation of the mineral components with bacteria. Um, so what, are, what else starts to happen is the bacteria sticks to the minerals. Um, and they start to form alkaline glues. Once that happens, all these little bits start to stick together and form microaggregation, which I think is happening here. It's a little bit out of focus, but you can start to see that the little bits start to clump together. This is the first stages of soil system development and soil structure development that leads to oxygen in the root zone. This sample is a little bit further along in the ecosystem, and you can see right away that clearly even if you have no experience, there's a visual difference in the two slides. Um, in, in, uh, whoops, there we go. In this sample, um, you know, everything's really dispersed. Everything's spread out, nothing's really sticking together. When we start to incorporate fungi, which is pointed to by this green arrow, well, now all the little aggregates start to get glued together and we form macro aggregation. When we form macro aggregation, we start to pull all these little bits together and it forms um, pore space for root zone, it um, creates pore space for oxygen, and the system typically really starts to take off. Uh, this blue arrow is pointing to um, actinobacteria, um, which is a type of bacteria that will link end to end like a chain and form uh, filamentous hyphae like the fungi. Um, we know it's an actinobacteria because bacteria are some of the smallest things that you can really make out at the 400 times magnification like this is, and you know it's an actinobacteria versus another type of fungi when it's really hard to get it into focus. A lot of the bacteria go in and out of focus very quickly on the microscope. And you know it almost looks like light bending in a mirror or a piece of glass or on water or something like that. Um, but you know, as you get better with the microscope, it gets easy to identify these things. Um, and we know this is a beneficial fungi from certain characteristics. It's a little hard to see in this image, um, but there are little septa here. Um, they're like railroad tracks. And in what we would determine beneficial fungi for the sake of this type of quantification, we want these septa to be an even distance apart. And we also want the side of the hyphae to be a consistent distance apart, j literally just like railroad tracks. And we know through other scientific research that beneficial saprophytic fungi behave in a certain way and they'll form a cell and they'll move their little like internal ooze 
into that cell and they'll create off another hyphal wall. And then when they go to grow, they'll create another one. And so they do it in these blocks. Other types of fungi that we would put more into the undesirable category do not form their bodies in that way. And this is a sample that I took um, from, you know, a pretty established old growth forest. Um, I took this sample before I was really able to um, quantify specifically. This was really early on, one of the first pictures I took when I got into microscopes. Um, but I would guess this is like a five to one fungal to bacteria ratio or something. And this just happens to be a zoomed in extremely, extremely fungal component. And so we can see that there's a tremendous amount of these fungal hyphae that when we follow the characteristics that Dr. Lane sets for it, it's easy to tell that this is something we'd put into the beneficial category. So you can see that the side walls are very consistent in width. Um, there are little septa here that are dividing those cells. And then you can see everything is very pulled in together. So we've got, um, you know, big aggregate here. We've got some aggregate here and a ton of extra space. Um, and that extra space is filled up with oxygen and roots and big ass fruits. <clears throat> this is a fungi um, that we would actually put into the omycete category and we would put it in the bottom of our soil test in the undesirable category. We can tell this guy by it is forming a hyphae. It is forming, um, you know, something that we would call fungi that most people might recognize. But where I start to get concerned about this guy is it's a very irregular width of the hyphae itself. There's no septa and, um, you know, it's clear. The beneficial fungi are uh, decomposing um, carbon and other compounds producing humic acid, and that humic acid and fulvic acid starts to tint the fungi. So a lot of the um, beneficial fungi will be light tan to dark brown. Sometimes they're wild colors like pink or blue, but very rare, um, or well, less rare, um, but they're, they're mostly a tan. And so this guy is very clear. Um, this type of animal recently got reclassified from a fungi um, to actually a protozoa, which is really interesting. Um, so, you know, from my understanding, it's not even really in the fungal community, but as cannabis growers, we believe this guy right here is the goal. And, you know, my personal research and experience shows that this is actually the number one cause for powdery mildew and pest disease issues. Uh, here's a bacterial feeding nematode, which we've talked about earlier. Um, the blue arrow points to the mouthpieces. And so if we know what this animal is trying to do, we can understand what type it is by what its little body parts look like. And so this guy is a bacterial feeding nematode. We know it's a bacterial feeding nematode because it's got a little tube here for vacuuming up bacteria. Um, other fungi might have a little poker in here um, or some crazy looking mouth parts. Um, bacterial feeding nematodes will always have one or two bulbs. Um, and so this bulb right here is actually where they squish up the bacteria. And if this was a video, you'd actually be able to see this little guy going, pumping like a heart. And so by these various characteristics, um, we know that there's a bacterial feeding nematode. Now, if you got some of the HB nematodes, which I spoke about earlier, the heterabditis, um, those can be a little bit harder to identify than this guy. Um, this, this bulb right here is very easy to see but this um, front bulb is a little bit harder to see or sometimes very difficult to see, and the mouth parts are a little less pronounced. Um, but if you get both the Steinernema and the Heterabditis nematodes at the same time, and you create a water solution, put a sample onto a slide and look at it, they are very different. Um, and you can usually tell um, which one is which. Um, believe it or not, a lot of times the labs get them mixed up. And so for clients, a lot of times we'll, um, check them beforehand to make sure we're even putting in what we think we are. <clears throat> this is a slide that I borrowed from David Johnson, who in some ways is carrying on some of the soil food web work that Dr. Lane did in the university setting. Um, you can go find some of his stuff on YouTube and you can find this entire presentation on YouTube, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, what this one image is showing is various fungal to bacteria ratios that they created in the soil by mixing compost into soil um, the compost had high fungal populations, and when they blended it with the other potting soil, they then did a microscope analysis and came up with different fungal to bacteria ratios. I do want to caution and say that fungal to bacteria ratios aren't everything. 
But if we're going to start moving the consciousness of the community forward, we need to start with something that we can all wrap our minds around. And the fungi to bacteria ratio is a pretty easy starting point because you're talking about taking the fungal biomass and dividing it by the bacterial biomass to come up with a ratio. So in the, in the situation here of a 0 0.04, that means that the bacteria is far higher than the fungi because we're dividing fungi by bacteria to get a number. So if it's greater than one, that means the fungal populations is higher than the bacterial populations. So here we're significantly low in fungal contents to bacterial contents. We get a 0 0.04 on up to a much greater, you know, 3.6 times the fungal biomass to bacterial biomass. In this situation, I think they're using a bell bean or something like that. But um, in our cannabis work, this is definitely part of the phenomenon. Um, fungal to bacteria ratios also usually indicate stability of the system or age of the system. It's hard to get a high fungal to bacteria ratio in the beginning of a system because the bacteria grow much faster. And so it's hard to correct that fungal to bacteria ratio if we're doing something that inhibits fungal growth. When I first started doing the microscope analysis for people through social media, um, you know, for the first couple years of that work, the most common fungal to bacteria ratios we see are 0.09 to 0.12. I'm not sure why mathematically those pop out the most often, but um, in my personal experience, I've seen those numbers very commonly. So even people um, that you believe are doing very well with um, living soil, it's likely they're less than a 0.2 F to B ratio, and it and for cannabis, my belief is it should be somewhere greater than like 0.75 um, over one. It's hard to get a farm above one um, at this stage in the game, but we're getting more and more clients to get above that. But for the first couple of years, I did that. Um, the highest F to B ratio I got from a sample that was outside of our client base was a 0.23, and that 0.23 was the highest for almost two years. Um, after we did a couple um, workshops and started connecting people with our compost, we started seeing that fungal to bacteria ratio increase. But I would still say community-wide on a fungal to bacteria ratio by itself, most people are over here near the 0.04, significantly less than 0.1, or excuse me, 1.0, which would be far less than cannabis um, theoretically naturally evolved in. <clears throat> um, this is a quick representation of pH, which is something we are familiar with. You know, some people would say we're looking for like a 6.4 goal or a 6.0 goal or what have you. But nonetheless, you know, ideal sways alkaline. You know, we, we sway towards alkaline away from ideal and we can sway towards acid away from ideal. And this is a, you know, a concept that most people are familiar with. If we move to concentrations of oxygen, they still have a similar scale where we're looking for somewhere ideal and we can vary um, to greater oxygen levels or to less oxygen levels away from what we would determine ideal. And so a, a, an environment that's um, high in oxygen would be called aerobic. A environment that is low in oxygen is called anaerobic. And then an environment free of oxygen would be called anoxic. And so, you know, we're, you know, my personal preference is we're looking for as high as oxygen in the root zone based on what I learned in hydroponics um, in regards to plant health, root growth, and overall output. It's my personal opinion that most people that believe that organics can't keep up with high, uh, hydroponics is simply because it's much easier to get higher levels of dissolved oxygen into a hydroponic system than it is in a living soil system or a soil system unless you harness the capabilities of a true soil food web system. Once you do that, then the oxygen levels get very high. And if we add a layer on top of that, we can put this um, word we've heard a couple times, the facultative anaerobic zone. And you know, nature has organisms that are very specialized and some organisms only function over here in the very high oxygen. And once oxygen starts to decrease, they go into a dormant state. If it happens very rapidly, they die or, or science would say lice. And in the center here, we have the facultative anaerobic zone. This is kind of like, you know, right now we're changing presidents 
and we have what they call a transition team. And so when we go from, uh, you know, whatever side you want to call uh, Republican or Democrat, um, in the center, we've got a transition team that, that's, that helps so we don't have this hard line. Um, interestingly enough, gnats are always found when there's a high population of facultative anaerobes because they want to um, deposit their babies or their larvae where there's an abundance of anaerobic bacteria, which are their food. And so if you have an abundance of gnats in your system, that's a pretty good indication that you're predominantly operating in this facultative anaerobic zone. And then if you go here from whatever would be the center to more anaerobic, all the disease and root pathogens, from my understanding, happen on this side. And so we can completely avoid root zone pathogens by staying above in this aerobic zone. And that's something that Dr. Lame made claim to, and that's something that I've personally seen in my own work. Um, it's very common that you'll see uh, spores to um, disease-causing fungi, and the number of spores you see in a given sample can give you an indication of how long that soil or how recently that soil has been anaerobic. But if they're not functioning, that means that those spores were created at some point under some conditions, but you're not currently operating under that, which is pretty interesting. And then on top of that, I tried to layer some colors that will make more sense as we move on to some of the later slides. But, um, you know, essentially this green indicates that we're within the minimum set by Dr. Lane. Blue indicates that we exceed them in a beneficial way. Orange means that we're below the standards set by Dr. Lane. And red means we're either dysfunctionally high or extremely low. In my personal experience, the more aerobic you get and the more green and blue block boxes you get on our soil test, you'll have healthier plants. The further we get into the anaerobic zone, you definitely see worse pests, definitely. And this is one where I overlaid some of the outcomes that we've seen. Like I said, we've worked with literally hundreds of farms. We've worked with millions of square feet of cultivation space, space large and small, um, local and international. And there are some very common patterns. Um, one of the most common patterns that I see as the most consistent is thrips. Thrips seems to always happen in a soil system that is either having major disruptions in water, um, which also lends itself to disruptions in biology. And you'll have not anaerobic, but not high enough um, beneficial soil organisms. And so in my personal interpretation, thrips in a living soil system is an indication that nutrient delivery is not happening fast enough because of low nutrient cycling rates. Uh, and then of course we have gnats right in the middle and then spider mites are slightly more anaerobic, molds are slightly more anaerobic, and then any russet mite, broad mite, root aphids are remarkably anaerobic um, or have an extreme environmental condition that are leading to the same type of nutritional disruptions that happen during this type of environment. Then over here, we've got 30% total cannabinoids. Um, we've now worked with a handful of farms that have gotten into the 30s, mid 30s, and now high 30s. Um, a couple of those farms are starting to break into the 40% total cannabinoids, which when we first started doing that, people would interrupt that statement with your line. It was so unbelievable for them. Um, but we've now done it in about five or six facilities in regulated states that are getting state mandated testing. And then if you get much higher than people are used to, you get what I call fish stories, which are outcomes and results that nobody believes, like, you know, 10% return on GMO or, you know, whatnot. People don't believe that, but it definitely happens. <clears throat> um, this is a slide that I've been using since um, the first workshop I put together. And this was a sample that came to us in um, early 2016. This is an old version of our, um, our uh, uh, soil sample data. On the left side here, you've got all the organisms we're counting, which are bacteria, fungi, F to B ratio. The amoebae and the flagellates are the beneficial predators or aerobic predators of bacteria. And then we have nematodes. Actinobacteria is a good thing, but it also is an indication of decreased oxygen. So we put it down below in the anaerobic indicators next to ciliates, which ciliates are the um, anaerobic or decreased oxygen predators of bacteria. 
and the omycetes are that clear fungi or the water molds. These numbers are the um, uh, ranges that Dr. Elaine Ingham has um, determined in her four decades of research, and in our experience, um, you know, they're pretty dead on. We've made our own slight adjustments to them in the commercial cannabis space into um, certain things, but in essence, what she's saying is definitely spot on from what I'm saying or what we're seeing. And again, so a blue a blue box indicates that this value exceeds in a beneficial way the um, ideal minimum range. Green box means that it's within the ideal range. Orange box is low, and red is either extremely dysfunctionally low or extremely dysfunctionally high. And in this certain example, there was a um, a regulated facility in a legal state that had three different flowering rooms and they had russet mites. And so we sampled each of those rooms. Um, what you find here, um, you know, when you compare it to a healthy yield, you see extremely low bacteria levels and you see extremely high ciliates and omycete levels. Um, in this particular example, and I will say it took me a while to really figure out what the russet mite biological passport was being created by because it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense how you could have such high populations here, but such low populations here. And essentially what's happening in this situation is this farm was following um, bad tea brewing advice. They were using a tea brewer that in no way would they be able to create a healthy um, tea as per defined by Dr. Lane Ingham. And so that led to a lot of pest issues. So in this situation, this farm was using uh, microbutanol and AVID to control the um, biblical um, mold and russet mite populations. And so the russet mites, a lot of times, you have the inter introduction of very anaerobic um, and high populations of anaerobic organisms from tea brewing or other processes like that. And then the beneficial bacteria and fungi are being lowered by the application of IPM products. Um, in this situation, um, this is a sample from an employee that worked at this facility. Um, this particular facility um, was pretty influenced by um, the people they were getting their information from, and they weren't honestly open to our corrections or considering that their tea brewing could be the absolute cause of their russet mite um, and, and mold. So the employee contacted us and asked, you know, how do I stop the russet mites from coming home with me? <laughs> Um, so we stopped the tea brewing processes, made a couple changes, and then took a sample, and this was the outcome. So by simply not spraying with microbutanol and Avid, and by not doing the dis extremely dysfunctional tea brewing um, strategies of this farm, we were able to minimize ciliates and omycetes to zero. Um, we're now at 500 and 300 fungi, which is within the minimum range. It's still low, but it's adequate to get a decent yield. And then we have high levels of nutrient cycling organisms. So Essentially, we've got no disease pressure with extremely fast delivery of nutrients with adequate stability of the system, which is remarkably different from the russet mite example. Um, and what's interesting, I don't want to get too big on my soapbox, but you know, there's people in the community that give advice that's extremely detrimental to farmers. And one of the reasons why I use this old slide is like a ring on a tree of when this advice was given and how long it takes to change it. And I'm going to continue using this slide until the advice changes. Um, I talked directly to the um, influencer that advised this farm on their tea brewing. I've talked to him in person twice. I've sent very lengthy emails years ago, and they still haven't changed their advice market wide. And it's and it's extremely destructive to the community. It's putting farms out of business, and it's just really time everybody wake up and figure out what is working and what's not working. And um, this is, a, um, uh, this is a comparison of four different outcomes from around the same time period. So again, we have the healthy yield. So we're meeting the minimums for bacteria and fungi in a positive way. Our F to B ratio is a 0.6, which is suitable. We have extremely high levels of amoebae and flagellates, which is leading to a tremendous speed and delivery of nutrients that leads to good plant growth without pests. Um, this particular sample hit one gram per watt on a 600 watt um, Gavita in a tent with a with a um, you know pretty new grower. Here we've got the spider mites. So spider mites has very high bacteria, so that's good. We've got good stability of the system in form of nutrient potential. We're low on fungi, which means limited oxygen in the root zone, 
which is compromising our F to B ratio. Here's that 0.04. Um, we have acceptable levels of amoebae and flagellates, which is interesting because in the spider mite example, you'll still get good growth, you'll still get good yield, but down here, the key is the ciliates and the omycetes, we're going we're gonna to run into pest pressure with these. Um, the ciliates are releasing nitrogen in the wrong form for the flowering cannabis plant, so it's like if you're supplementing with the grow formula during bloom, which if you do that in any example, you're going to end up with mold or mites. Ideally, this omicet value, um, back in 2016 when I made this, our goal was to be, um, you know, 25% of this beneficial fungi value or less. You can see here we're at 50%, so that's problematic. Um, and then if you compare that to the mold, so very similar. We've got good stability of bacteria. Um, we got about half the fungi we need. But if you look down here, we have double the omicet value of the beneficial fungi. Um, this mold passport is the most, in my opinion, the most predictable thing in all of cannabis. We have done so much evaluation of moldy, um, or, you know, plants that are showing visible signs of powdery mildew. And I mean, 99 out of hundred times it's because of this, that one out of hundred times where it's not, this is an environmental issue, but the environmental issue will also have an effect on organisms and it will still trend towards this. Um, and then again, we compare the russet mite example, um, you know, in the russet mite mold and spider mites, the very common theme is we have, you know, very high levels of ciliates and very high levels of omycetes, which leads to various pest and disease pressure. I'm not necessarily asserting that these numbers will always lead to this outcome because there's still the concept of soil chemistry, there's still the concept of um, genetic potential. There's still the concept of um, the, the feeding strategies you're taking having an effect on outcome, but they're pretty damn close. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I, get a lot of, I get a lot of resistance to this concept, but I promise you more people are gonna be onto this because you know this is something we figured out in 2016 and it continues to be extremely accurate in outcome. And then this was, uh, this was a comparison I made. This is our newest version of our report. Um, so now we have the organisms, so the nutrient storage, we've got the beneficial bacteria, actinobacteria, total fungi. We've got now the diameter of a hyphae on our report because it's important to know um, what size fungi are in there because um, the better the fungi typically, the wider they are. F to B ratio, <clears throat> we've now separated out the bacterial feeding, fungal feeding, and predatory nematodes so we can keep track of um, what predatory nematodes we have or, or how that breaks out. And then we've got the root feeding nematodes down here. Um, this was an example I put together to show the variation in compost that's available to people on the market and how difficult it is to reach a true soil food web goal with the compost available. So these are three samples of compost um, taken from just different data sets that we have combined with the numbers that we have in the compost that we produce and have been producing. Um, to my knowledge, you know, Sarah and I were the first people to get to large commercial volumes of really what we would consider biologically complete compost, meaning adequate and high levels of beneficial aerobic organisms, appropriate levels of nutrient cycling organisms with low or non-existent levels of ciliates and omycetes. You can see in these other examples, you know, we've got dysfunctionally high bacteria here. Um, we've got um, nowhere near adequate fungi, which is equal to the omycetes in all samples, damn near. Um, a lot of zeros, and it's and most importantly right here, the nutrient cycling. And so you can provide benefit by adding one of these composts, but you're gonna have slower growth. You're gonna have um, pest and mold pressure. And so, you know, we are starting to see more people produce what we would consider biologically complete compost and it's becoming more available. But if you're into living soil, I really encourage you to reach out to somebody that is actually producing biologically complete compost. There's only a few of us, um, but you, you should get some of this in your hand. Um, I'm pretty proud of the fact of the work that we did to get into this because you know we spent three years developing our process to end up with biologically complete compost. And I, you know, I'm really proud of these numbers. I'm 
I'm not sure that there's anybody else that's really producing numbers this high, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, we're not the only ones, but we're definitely doing some good shit, in my opinion. Whoa, that's crazy. Mirror and a mirror and a mirror and a mirror. Uh, there we go. I think we lost Peter. I hope that was good. I hope I made sense. And I hope you enjoyed. I don't know what to do now that Peter's not here. <laughs> um, I guess I could try and find some uh, comments. It's a lot of talk about avocado tech, which is cool. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll just uh, sit here awkwardly and stare at each other until Peter returns. Peter! <laughs> I guess, does anybody have any questions on that? And there, there I am. Okay. <laughs> Panic. Uh, <laughs> blue's digging it. Uh, yeah. That's the avocado tech guy, right? Blue green. That is blue. You've talked to blue. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Uh, blue will come back on soon. Um, I mean, there are questions from a long time ago. Uh, yeah, talk for a minute. People are talking worms and eggshells. Digest compost. Mm -hmm. They were talking worm mm -hmm. bins and compost stuff. Uh, I think it's important with the concept. You know, there's a lot of misconception about what's good for soil food web based on worm population increases. Um, and there's certain techniques that lead to an increase in worms, but I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. And that's kind of why I like the avocado tech because it's not detrimental. It's just increasing their populations. There's other things that you can do that will increase worm populations, but it's because you killed biological populations. And so worms are eating those soil food web organisms and if you put something into the soil that hurts them, well, there's that whole uh, an abundance of that, you know, primordial stew for the worms to eat on. So there are some older techs prior to the avocado tech that I think are extremely detrimental to soil organisms that do increase worm populations. And that is hard for people to wrap their mind around. Um, but that's why I think the avocado tech's catching on so much better is because it's, it's a way that you can increase populations without killing things off. Well, can you give an example or two of something that would make the worm population explode, but the microbial population collapse? Uh, the most common one is the neem cake. Okay. Neem cake. Yeah, that's it'll definitely increase worm populations, but it's because you killed everything. Got it. So it's okay. just the, the food supports. Um, there's a question about tea, and I, you know, um, I've said it a couple times. Actually, here, here, well, yeah, go go for the tea one, but uh, this one flew by. Yeah. Well, just quick on the tea, what we're seeing, you go back earlier in the episode, but in the commercial space, it's really problematic to teach people tea. It's extremely volatile. And, um, you know, there's almost no tea brewing equipment that will actually achieve what Dr. Elaine is talking about. Um, you can put that one back up there. Uh, bu, bu, bu. No, I just have no idea where it went. Someone's asking, how do you get fungi in your soil? And that's through inoculation. And so, if you go back to the slide of the bag compost, there's no fungi in it. So you can't inoculate with something that doesn't contain what you're trying to inoculate. So you really need to get in contact with the few people that are producing biologically complete compost. And so um, we sell it on our website, crescivegrowers.org, C-R-E-S-C-I-V-E, you know, growers.org. Um, you can also contact Catalyst Bio Amendments. They're doing a pretty good job. Um, and there's a couple soil food web graduates that are making small piles. But aside from that, the people that are making compost aren't using biological assess assessment in their process. And so how can you improve biological outcome of something you're not measuring or quantifying? And their goal, most compost producers goal is not to produce biologically complete compost. It's to reduce waste streams. So, Okay, I found the... Uh... So enzymes. So I can tell you what I do know about enzymes. So enzymes are like little wrenches. So like uh, John Kemp uses the example of putting together a greenhouse. You know, if you have a 9 16 wrench, you can use it over and over and over again on a uh, 3 8 bolt. 
Um, and so enzymes work like a wrench that can be used over and over. They're also the catalyst. But then on the other side, if you think of something like citric acid or a res cleaner or Clearex or Dr. Zymes or a big time exterminator, um, those are citric acid, which is an enzyme, but that is one of the most antimicrobial compounds we've ever used. Um, and we actually use various enzyme products for the purpose of sterilizing the soil without doing too much detriment. And so, um, you know, a citric acid enzyme product is very effective at what we call, you know, restarting the soil. So if soil biology gets too far out of whack, we can um, wipe the slate clean, so to speak, with an enzyme product without turning things very anaerobic and then re-inoculate and then we can make rapid changes to a soil that have gotten off the rails. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Any organic amendments you've noticed to boost THC? Um, not specifically an amendment because that's really hard to replicate because the farms that we're working with are doing so many different things. Even within the farms that we're with, are within our client base, they're all doing slight variations of the core strategy essentially. So it's very hard to say this amendment caused this increase in THC. I can tell you that the hemp people that we work with are very concerned about nitrogen levels because if you put too much nitrogen into a hemp plant, you'll, you'll pop pop hot or well you produce more than that 0.3 THC in certain cultivars so there's, there must be a correlation between THC percentages and um, nitrogen but in in my personal experience as somebody that has gone very very in deep uh, with biological assessment by far the greatest effect I've seen on increasing potency total cannabinoids terpenes THC whatever you want you get an all level increase by increasing the soil organism populations and ratios like I showed on that first slide. And so we've worked with a handful of cultivators that were already doing well as far as potency is concerned. And as we start to increase them up the scale towards what we would determine as desirable, they always have an increase in yield and potency every single time. Um, so lots of questions. Actually, this is interesting just because Brandon's big on Bokashi and obviously Alan. And so what, what are your thoughts on Bokashi? I think Bokashi is a great tool. You know, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's accessible. If you try to make thermal compost like Dr. Lane, it, it's a journey. Um, but a lot of people can get the raw materials to make Bokashi and, and have success there for the goal of producing Bokashi. Um, my personal, my personal obstacles with it is it's such a small slice of the overall goal that I feel is, is the actual goal. And so it's, it's, it's a great starting point. I think it's a important primary species, but I think if you're relying on Bokashi only, you, you're really missing out on a lot, you know, probably, you know, based on what we've seen with other farms that were very bacterial dominant, missing a lot of the soil food web organisms. So not necessarily saying a Bokashi situation, but more importantly, mostly bacteria and very low or non-existent everything else. Um, if you increase that fungal population, you get nutrient cycling up with protozoan amoeba and nematodes. You know, there's been several situations where we've seen 20 to 40% increase in total cannabinoids of people that were already doing well. And we've replicated that on multiple farms. Uh, so, so this is, and actually, again, getting back to my home grow, we have lots of eggshells and, uh, are, are you into like water soluble calcium, like with vinegar and things like that, or not so much? Well, it just, um, eggshells bring up the question of, what produced those eggshells? What were they fed? And did they have the potential to even produce calcium? So, you know, I'm one of the few people that's actually doing analysis of different KNF products. Um, Nick Tomasini is another person that's doing actual nutrient analysis of KNF products. And, you know, there was just one done where they compared the water soluble calcium and there was there was more calcium in the organics alive MPK product than there was in the water soluble calcium. And so 
we need to we need to have more um, a, a broader mindset into the things that we're saying. So we can't have a water soluble calcium through eggshells unless there's calcium in the eggshells to become water soluble. So that's where organics really gets complicated and it's extremely varied. You would be mind blown at the output and variation in different in different products. So, you know, for example, like something like feather meal, I've added feather meal to a soil at twice the rate I have before and gotten half the nitrogen out of it. And so there's just because the bag says, you know, four, five, five, five or whatever, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that product has, you know, con even consistent levels of what's supposed to be in there. So we see that a lot with like uh, even the aminos, we see variations in nitrogen concentration in that product from batch to batch. Um, a lot of the other nutrients, we see considerable variation from batch to batch. And so, not to give you an overcomplicated answer all the time, but it is that complicated, and we need to introduce these concepts into the consciousness so that we don't so we don't think so statically, like, well, I read a recipe for water-soluble calcium, I followed it, I should have X. It's like, well, you might not, you know, you might not, so... I think it's great that people get into natural farming techniques. We just, you know, need accountability. So nitrogen fixing cover crops. This is another one I'm kind of a poo poo on. Um, <laughs> I think, well, I like the comment. Ayahuasca is a companion plant. That's a good plant. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do that. So, my objection, well, not my objection, my journey of nitrogen fixing cover crops is when I first get into this, you hear about all the things from permaculture and things that we can incorporate. And then I've worked with farms that are trying to incorporate these things and then come to find out it's not really doing what we're doing. And that's where we need to really expand our mindset to encompass the entire, the entire spectrum of the things that we're talking about. So for example, with nitrogen fixing cover crops, just because you planted a nitrogen fixing cover crop doesn't mean there's nitrogen fixation happening. You need certain considerations for that. So for example, um, if, you're, if you're growing a nitrogen fixing cover crop that forms nodules like clover, you should at some point pull that plant out and look at the roots. One, see if there's nodules formed. If there is nodules, cut them open with a razor blade and see if they're, they look like a medium rare steak on the inside. They should be pink. Because you can form nodules, but if there's not enough iron or um, more specifically the heme molecule, which is similar to iron, um, there's not nitrogen fixation happening. So you have to plant a nitrogen fixing cover crop. You have to have the presence of nitrogen fixing bacteria. You have to have the presence of the heme molecule. Then you get nitrogen fixation. And so in my experience as a person that has quantified everybody in the industry damn near, whether personally or through people that are following their instructions, you know, almost none of these people have actual nitrogen fixation in the clover. So then what you end up with is a cool season clover crop that's in with a warm season cannabis crop. The clover's unhappy. It's harvesting or it's harboring mites and thrips. Like I personally have been trying to get people to get rid of clover since mid 2016 because we would go to a farm and they'd be like, how do we get rid of these thrips and spider mites? They'd be like, take out the clover cover crop. And they don't want to hear that. And if you, if you look at a facility very intently that's going from harvest to harvest and you're trying to navigate the regulated space, you will see that as you harvest your plant, all those thrips or mites go into the cover crop in the clover and then they under overwinter or whatever they call it. And then when you replant again, they jump right into it. And so it just, the clover, this is where I really start to get like my old man hat on, but like, you know, nobody's noticing that the shit's loaded with bugs. Like even if you scroll back in Instagram, you go through people's pictures and they're all raving about clover and you zoom in, there's all kinds of pock marks on it. It's like, <sighs> so when I talk to a guy, I can't think of his name right now. Um, uh, he was introduced to me by Eric with Stacking Functions. He's a uh, he's a permaculture um, cover crop guru, 
and I was talking to him about a year and a half ago and we were talking about the concepts of Clover and I'd already decided I didn't like it. And I told him that and his, his only response was, why would you be putting a cool season plant with a warm season plant? And I'm like, thank you. Like we need to research more deeply the things that we repeat and reproduce over and over again. Um, you know, so I don't know. Uh, well, I don't uh we're, we're three hours and 47 minutes into uh into our soil our soil deep dive you want to you want to call it a day and uh we'll come back again <laughs> yeah I mean yeah it's yeah I think I think we did it so um there's a couple question about dichondra I love dichondra I feel pretty responsible for that being in the in the growing community. Uh, Sarah was working up at Dr. Lane's farm when they first built it and they were exploring cover crops. That conjure was one of the ones that they tried out. We started putting it into our cannabis clients. Um, it's my favorite, but it can get thick. If it does get too thick, then you can um, cause um, anaerobic conditions in the soil. But in my experience, it's been working well most places. There's only been a couple places where it felt like it wasn't um, wasn't the best. The one thing with dichondra is it grows kind of like Bermuda grass. Once it's there, that shit's there. So make sure you want it before you put it in there. But I love it. If you only choose one cover crop, dichondra will satisfy most of the check boxes that you're after with one seed. And so when we're trying to scale and expand and work through many facilities, dichondra is an easy answer. It likes, it tolerates the high feeds. So you can cram feed into your plant. Clover does not like high strength feeds and gets buggy. Um, you know, dichondra, you plant it once, it stays there. So, yeah, man. Looking at, uh... All right. I think, <laughs> got I think that's a wrap. And, uh... I think that's all I got for the week, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been going since like 8.50 in the morning. Uh... I'm you ready to go food. just chill the fuck out on the couch. Yeah, me too. So, so. But yeah, man, thanks again. I always appreciate you having me on here. I, you know, some of these uh, mainstream people are afraid of me. And I just appreciate that you know what I'm about. You've seen my work in person. You give me a shot to speak to people. I and uh, I, I if, if you wanted to speak all the time, I'd have you speak all the time. But I'm, I'm very cognizant that... Uh, you you come out of your turtle shell, <laughs> you drop knowledge, you take wax on the head, you go back into your shell, <laughs> and then I just I, I just let you chill out until you're ready to come back out of the shell. I appreciate. It. I think as we move further away from 2020, but in earlier years, it was just better if I didn't speak publicly, um, because what I'm saying of the reality of the world is in stark contrast to what influencers are telling people to do. And so if I mention something, they feel threatened and attack me and talk trash and bump me on the head. We're getting out of that. People are getting smarter than the influencers. People are getting more educated than the influencers. They're more adaptive and, and open to these type of things. So like I said, I just thank you for the opportunity to have the platform and speak things that are, I think are important. Because you know, if you haven't been paying attention, the, the entire planet is in a health crisis. And it's really time for us as a regenerative community to really get our act together, really come up with actionable strategies that lead to success, that lead to true regeneration, that allow farmers to stay in business and have success, so that we can actually make an impact on the planet through whatever strategy. You know, Brandon's strategy is different than mine, but he's doing it. You know, and I got respect for that. Sorry, I just hit the wrong. Uh, so, so basically, someone asked a while ago if you are consulting. I would assume the answer is yes. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the name yeah. of your compost is so if you go, uh, I think on Instagram, if you go here and yeah. then the website is what? Uh, the products are sold at crescivegrowers.org. And then our main website and then our, I like our, yeah, that's the shop. And then our information is at, uh, crescivesoil.org. Um, and, uh, we, we do sell compost that kind of popped up. We don't, we don't have a name for the compost. We just sell it, um, through our website. Um, yeah. So see you there. All right. 
Well, let us let us end on that on our mm-hmm. Wednesday afternoon. And actually, let me just check one thing before I let you go. Um, uh, now that no one responded yet, but uh, I was going to say we may have a what? No, no, no. Carry on. No, I was going to say there there may be a because on Thursday on Thursday night I wanted to potentially do a a hash show. Um, and I wanted to get Ganja Gill and Steve Cantwell uh, to come on because yeah. they just collaborated together. So, but neither That's of them it. responded yet. So, uh, Scott's IG is. Yeah, I don't have one. I don't even put it on there. I haven't. Well, no, you you, you guys have that. The 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 yeah. wife the wife's been on fire uh, for the past <laughs> couple hours on the IG. So yes. give her. Is she like ten feet away from you? No, she's in the other room, so it doesn't feedback weird. But um, okay. yeah, yeah she, I, she... I, I found it's just better if I don't participate in social media. <laughs> you let her be your filter. Well, and I just I, I can only be authentic. Like I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but like if you're saying some clowny shit, like I'm I'm gonna require you to come correct because. My, you got to keep in mind, my job is working with the farmer after the popular trend has failed them and almost put them out of business. I got to bring them back out. And so, you know, if you're perpetuating the same nonsense that you as an influencer know is problematic. Like I just, I lack the impulse control to not say shit. <laughs> you know? Because I got to be right. Yeah. Well, hopefully, so, so what I always wanted to do what, when we first started uh, doing doing the live shows was to basically get you with like someone whose research you've read and are like fascinated by mm-hmm. just to like have you interview them. And so if that's something you'd be down to do, I think that yeah. could be kind of cool. I mean, I don't, I've tried to get Dr. Lane on a podcast to talk about the, um, the ecological monograph. She has some really interesting insight. I'm only able to translate so much, like what I was talking about in the beginning. I mean, if you could ever get her on to, that would be really cool. Well, but, but th- I mean, f- her aside, I mean, think of all the academic research you've consumed. And just kind of like, it's like, that's pretty interesting. Like if you could pick that person's brain for an hour, that's kind of what I wanted to do where you just get to pepper them with questions after it's like, I read your research and I got a bunch of questions. Yeah. I'll definitely think about that. Or maybe like I see Matthew Gates just put a comment. He's another researchy guy. He doesn't necessarily, um, uh, why don't he might produce, um, stuff, but He's another guy that's read a lot, um, so he's a uh, he's a he's a smart dude. But yeah, I'll think on that and see if I can. Uh, most of the people that I'd want to interview are deceased. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, that's tough, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I feel like it's like we just need one. I mean, Brandon a while ago. I mean, I he had sent me. Yeah, Brandon a while ago had sent me like stuff, you know, and I'm looking like these are a bunch of Italian researchers, Giuseppe Cola, Lori Hoagland, Maurizio Ruzzi. And I was like, fuck it, I'll reach out to him and just be like, you want to come on and talk with a couple hundred people, uh, you know, who are who are like interested? Because I think for the researchers, it's like what they're like people outside of my super small academic circle who like would appreciate <laughs> what I spent five years of my life researching. And it's like, yeah, they want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think with you as like the translator to the rest of us, like so what he's saying in plain English is. Right. No, totally. Well, that's what I like about Matthew Gates because. So I've, I've said this on other episodes, but it's like, it's important to use correct ter- terminology so we can be accurate, you know? Yeah, there you go. That's Matthew Gates. He's the um, predator insect guy. I'm not sure what his technical uh, um, title is, but dude's incredibly smart. But, um, you know, he's very accurate with his scientific 
wording, which is very important because then we can be accurate in directing people and specific and understand that. Um, I feel like my role is somewhere between that and the bro science. So I'm kind of in the middle where I'm like, sometimes I misuse or mispronounce words, but I can get a little bit closer to putting it on the ear of the bros uh, or speak it in jive. So that'd be kind of interesting, me and him. Like, if, if, if we're talking kind of in the uh, like predators eating prey and making them the nutrients bioavailable, like you guys eat the research mm -hmm. and then poop out uh, plain English available information for the rest of us. <laughs> that, that's that's my best way of describing it. it, it it's you digest it, and then uh, we're all waiting for the <laughs> yeah. for the the digested uh, plain English uh, translations. Well, well, in practical applications too. Keep in mind, my entire goal is practical success, and so there's things that I read or ideas that I had that I was thought was going to be great, but you start trying to implement them into the cultivation space and there's some sort of problem. So if I am saying something, it's, it's coming from replicated personal experience to where it's worked. You know, I think that's really important. Regenerative permaculture, organic community gets too far down the ideas rabbit hole. We need, we need to bring it back to what's functionally, applicable and able to execute and then move towards more sustainable from there. That's my strategy. we got to start at functional strategies for successful cultivation and slowly incorporate more and more sustainable aspects into them. Right. And then I think next time, one thing we didn't touch on that you had mentioned was, uh, uh, the fires, which obviously in California is yeah. relevant. So kind of what you've seen like yeah. in grows and kind of, how to <laughs> how to deal with it i guess yeah. um well, so we can we can that. pick that up next time yeah i think next time i could put together something from the nursery that you and i were both a part of and because it's just really interesting i you know that that was pretty profound research that we did and i think we're just at the point where i can just share it i was worried about protecting those ratios and honestly i think at this point fires are going to be problematic and we need to aim we need to give something people to aim for, I guess. I, I mean, think, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm starting to tear up. Uh, yeah, that was a sad story. Um, I, I would love to get Matt on and just have you guys talk. Yeah, because that would be cool. Because Matt, I guess for the people listening to this private conversation, I, I was a consultant with a nursery that Peter was affiliated with. Uh, one of the employees was named Matt. And so that could be interesting to have you know, Matt kind of comment on some of the practical applications that I wasn't there for. Um, and I stayed a little bit longer after Matt um, and was there day to day for uh, about five months, I think. Um, but the context of the property is it was in Santa Barbara during the fires. The fires came, dropped ash on the leaves. That caused the cascade of plant health problems. Uh, the mudslides impacted people from getting to the facility. That contributed to another decline in plant health. And then my, you know, Sarah and I's job the entire time was quantifying this property, the plant health decline, and then preparing it for a multi-million dollar uh, crop loss claim. So we were working directly with, you know, a major insurance provider on a major commercial facility. Really interesting. And it was a, <laughs> that was, it was yeah. a disaster. <laughs> yeah. And then, Which, and then uh, a guy died and got sad and it got weird like it always does. But right. still one of my, I mean, I'm still the most, I mean, of all the things that we've done, that, you know, that's that's probably top five of things I've ever pulled off in the workplace. I'm pretty proud of what we did there. You know, yeah. we saved genetics that were, you know, the, the owner, one of the owners of that property was, you know, Michael Masterson Smith, who is, the, you know, the guy that did university research at UCLA in the 90s to determine what cannabinoids actually affect cannabis. And so here I am, a person who's, you know, in some aspects been disowned by family members for my involvement in cannabis. I've got two family members right now that are in end stage cancer and going to die soon. Um, none of them will take cannabis. And it's crazy to me. It's like I've, you know, came out the trap and worked with provided plant health assistance to the guy that did medical research on cannabis. 
I got two friends that are dying right now of cancer. You can't tell them to consume cannabis. And it's like, I know the ratios. I know the formula. I know the strategy. I know the plant. I know the guy. I could get, I could get Michael on the phone and talk to these people. It's, yeah, no, Michael. So just for everyone watching, he, uh, basically, you know, did research on, uh, cancer stem cells and it's a very binary thing. Like, you know, you test stuff to see like, does it kill it or doesn't it? And cannabis, uh, you know, and, and he was using all synthetic, um, you know, like 40,000 compounds, like you, you get these things, you know, mm -hmm. Well, he, just... from what I remember, he explained it in a simplified fashion is they started with, the, you know, whatever, 20,000, 40,000 compounds known to medicine. They start injecting yeah, them like... in cancer cells. Yeah. And it either, it either increases them or decreases them or whatever. And so they whittled down those over years of research. I can't remember the exact numbers, but he said something like of the original 20,000, 30,000, whatever, they got down to like 12 compounds that reduce cancer. But of those compounds, like some of them were too toxic for humans and they whittle it down, whittle it down, whittle it down. And they ended up with like six cannabinoids and four compounds from medicine. Yeah. And then the, those compounds are used as blockbusters. So the reason why you have a cancer cell in your body is because it's not been given the, um, uh, the signal to remove itself from your body called apoptosis. And so science or, uh, uh, medicine uses blockbusters that that kind of trigger that process. The problem with the blockbuster drugs for medicine is they kill humans. Even if they work, they kill humans. But THC and CBD um, cause that same process to take place without causing problems. Right. Mm -hmm. And his next step was basically moving from synthetic cannabinoids to actual, you know, that, that, that was his whole entry into like the plant itself was, you know, could that be even, you know, better? Right. Um, and then there was a whole, yeah, just, <laughs> there's, there's a it's, lot of stuff we won't talk about on air, but, uh, but, but do know you average cannabis growers could absolutely cure cannabis or cure, uh, cancer. Absolutely. Right. Uh, even early on, right? I didn't even know what I was doing. I've had some friends with skin cancer. I'd make them up a little uh, salve or something and the skin cancer would come right off. Like it's so easy if you have the right compounds, man. Right. And at some point, maybe the collective consciousness will be a little bit more open to that. I think we're starting to hit that tipping point. But it's just so many people dying right now, man. Crazy. All right, well, let's all go smoke some weed. <laughs> and I got to do it outside because if I'm in the garage, it all gets into the house and then I get yelled at. Yeah. Keep it all up, right. homie. I'll, uh, I'll check in with you soon and uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks again. It, it was a rare Scott scan sighting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See, you next see, time, see, see everyone. I'm going to kill the broadcast. Yeah. Later.